Section 1 of On Being Negro in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. Section 1. This is personal. I would call it a document, except that the word has overtones of something official, vested, and final but i have been clothed with no authority to speak for others and what i have to say can be final only for myself i hasten to say this at the start for i remember my anger at the effrontery of one who a few years ago undertook to speak for me and twelve million others i concurred with practically nothing he said this was not important in itself but when one presumes to speak for me he must reflect my mind so accurately that I find no source of disagreement with him. To do this, he must be either a black-brained parrot or a god. Though there are many lack-brains, historic and present circumstances prove that there are no gods dealing with the problem of race, or as dangerous to the American ideal and as exhausting to individual Americans as it has been for three hundred years, it would have been settled long ago else the gods are singularly perverse there have been opportunities for complacent gods every crisis has brought an opportunity in revolutionary times even before we were a nation and the social structure and the ways of thinking that went with nationhood had solidified there was splendid scope but no gods arrived again in the awful pause following the civil war when the social structure of half the country had disintegrated and men prayed only to be told what to think and do no god answered instead the ready devils of positive unreason took over and ruled for a long time the first world war and the second held the potential too but we common men and the leaders we looked to were content with strong indictments and feeble measures there was a hell reek of baleful prophecy Quote, a small group of negro agitators and another small group of white rabble-rousers are pushing the country closer and closer to an interracial explosion which may make the race riots of the first world war and its aftermath seem mild by comparison unless saner councils prevail we may have the worst internal clashes since reconstruction with hundreds if not thousands killed in amicable race relations set back for decades Unquote. Footnote. Virginius Dabney, Nearer and Nearer the Precipice, The Atlantic Monthly, January 1943. End footnote. With such dire foreboding screaming in our ears, we fell back on a peculiar and American misinterpretation of Hegelian philosophy, that time, the flow of history, inevitably brings changes for the better. End of section one. Section two of On Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two. I speak only for myself for another reason also. From adolescence to death, there is something very personal about being a Negro in America. It's like having a second ego, which is as much the conscious subject of all experience as the natural self it is not what the psychologists call dual personality it is more complex and i think more morbid than that in the state of which i speak one receives two distinct impacts from certain experiences and one undergoes two distinct reactions the one normal and intrinsic to the natural self the other entirely different but of equal force a prodigy created by the accumulated consciousness of negroness an incident illustrates at the college in louisville where i taught during the depression a white slum crawled to the western edge of the campus i could see its dirt its poverty and disease in any direction i cared to look from my classroom window in the littered backyards each with a pit toilet snotty-nosed children with rickets played and lank-haired women shrilled obscenities at them all day long i remember seeing a man only once an ancient senile man bent with a monstrous hernia 
by the time autumn paled into winter the pity i felt for the people in the slum had been safely stacked away among other useless emotional lumber one day as i stood by the window thinking of other things i gradually became aware of movement in the yard directly below me the college building was as quiet as the church for it was a saturday when we had no classes there would have been no shock in seeing a woman of the neighborhood dressed only in a ragged slip but a powdery snow had fallen the night before and the day was bitter cold when i saw the woman who seemed quite young she was lurching and staggering in the rear of the yard a dog must have followed her out of the house for one stood by the open door watching and flicking its tail dubiously the woman's face was stiff and vacant but in her efforts to walk her body and limbs jerked convulsively in progressive tremors i could not tell whether she was drunk or sick as she floundered in the snow in the yard pity rose in me but at the same time something else also a gloating satisfaction that she was white sharply and concurrently felt the two emotions were of equal strength in perfect balance and the corporeal eye fixed in a trance at the window oscillated between them when she was within a few steps of the outhouse the poor woman lurched violently and pitched face downward in the snow somehow utterly unable to move i watched her convulsive struggles for several minutes the dog came down the yard meanwhile whining piteously and walked stiff-legged around the white and almost naked body the woman made a mess in the snow and then lay still finally i turned irresolutely and went into the corridor there was the entrance door and near it the telephone i could have gone out and a few steps would have brought me to the yard where the woman lay and i could have tried to rouse someone or myself taken her into the house i went to the telephone and called the police there is a drunken woman lying in the back yard of a house on eighth street seven hundred block i said you say drunk in her own yard then leave her lay but there doesn't seem to be anyone there and she may not be drunk you said she was drunk the voice said now what's the story there was a pause and who are you anyway she could freeze to death i said and hung up thus i washed my hands of it the woman was still lying there and the dog sat quivering and winding near her when a lone policeman arrived almost an hour later the next morning i read on a back page of the local paper that the woman aged twenty six had died of exposure following an epileptic seizure suffered while alone one can wash his hands but the smudges and scars on the psyche are different i offer no excuses for my part in this wretched episode excuses are unavailing the experiences of my negroness in a section where such experiences have their utmost meaning in fear and degradation cancelled out humaneness how many times have i heard negroes mutter when witness to some misfortune befallen a white person what the hell he's white isn't he what the exact psychological mechanism of this i cannot say but certainly the frustration of human sympathy and kindness is a symptom of a dangerous trauma never having been white i do not know whether southern white people feel a similar reaction to negroes but considering their acts and their words it can hardly be judged otherwise actions speak for themselves printed words not always for there is this about books on the race question how weary one grows of the phrase by southern whites they have no detachment they may seem to have within what has always seemed to me a questionable frame of reference there may be brilliant exposition analysis interpretation and even history they may roar as do the writings of david l cohen they may purr lyrically and graciously in the manner of archibald rutledge and the late william alexander percy they may remonstrate and apologize with unobtrusive erudition as virginius dabney's and hodding carter's editorials do or they may bristle with the flinty phraseology of howard odom's scholarship but nearly all of them elaborate an argument that is certainly not derived from self-knowledge and that cannot be effective as an instrument of self-control the reasoning in them is very subtle not to say metaphysical and it runs like this 
history is an imperative creative force from hegel again and man is its vassal it is beyond the reach and the control of conscience and also beyond direction and prophecy it created slavery the southwestern migration the civil war ku kluxism history does not conform to man's will it compels conformity and under this compulsion man and his society and his institutions are shaped into what they are and into what they become by categorical directives as potent as the word of god history is above moral judgment and history's errors are beyond redress man's world is mechanistic this is not mere error it too is symptomatic of a trauma all the more dangerous because this concept of history is what most southern whites believe when they are being reasonable about the race question when they are writing books about it or talking quietly in their living rooms or when they come together and gladly agree to cooperate in any sound program aimed at the improvement of race relations this reasoning at once defensive and defiant expresses itself in clichés which are the hardened arteries through which thought flows the white south is inexorably conditioned by cultural complexes in both the physical and cultural heritage of the south there are certain cumulative and tragic handicaps that represent overpowering factors in the situation there are legal and customary patterns of race relations in the south whose strength and age we recognize the idealism of these people of goodwill is negated by the meanings of their own phrases the pattern of reason these phrases express has been the most influential factor in race relations for nearly a hundred years and if hodding carter one of the young southern liberals is representative quote, the spirit of which these stories are symbols is harmless enough a little pathetic perhaps and naive and provincial let alone it will of course wear itself out some day not to-morrow or next year or the next year but some day End of quote. it promises to remain so for another century and that thorny prospect brings me yet another reason for the personal slant of this essay i do not wish to live with a race problem for the next one hundred years though of course i shall not live so long i do not wish to die knowing that my children and theirs to the third generation must live with it i have known it too long and too intimately already it has itself been an imperative channelizing more of my energies than i wish to spare through the narrow gorge of race interest yet i have felt myself in no sense a crusader i have not been uplifted with the compensatory afflatus of the inspired leader let me be quite frank i have done what i have not because i wanted to but because driven by a demonic force i had to the necessity has always been a galling affliction to me and the root of my personal grievance with american life this should not be hard to understand connected with all this of course has been a sense of impersonal obligation which i like to think of as growing out of a decent regard for the common welfare the civic sense has not expressed itself widely in group and racial activities and organizations for i am not that kind of person if it is a fault i am sorry for it i tried to be that kind of person at one time or another i have been a member of most of the racial uplift groups and am still a member of some and when i was in my early twenties i thought i had taken fire from the mass and that if need be i could exhort and harangue and make public protest with the best of them but i did not know myself so well then what i felt was merely the exuberant youthful need for self-losing identification it gives me sad amusement to recall that in those days a friend of mine used teasingly to call me marcus garvey a name that was the very apotheosis of blatant race chauvinism but i had no real chance to be blatant a habit i suppose like any other and no natural inclination nor could i really lose myself in the mass end of section two section three of on being negro in america by j saunders redding 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 3 But the years of my twenties were enkindling and tumultuous. The world was well into that series of social revolutions which started, we are told, with the First World War, and is not yet ended, and the American Negro people were a kind of revolutionary catalytic agent in their own country. It was their historic role, to be sure, but it had been suspended while Negroes played a supernumerary part in the European conflict. Americans in general seemed not to realize what had happened in Europe. They did not think of it as change. It was merely an eruption which they had helped put down, and were intent on sealing off with the cement of isolationism. But after the war, American Negroes re-enlivened the spirit of revolt, and the country was alarmed by the truculent persistence with which they fought for the dire anti-lynching bill, for instance, and by the vigor of their opposition to the confirmation of Judge John Parker to the United States Supreme Court, and by the inroads of communism among them, and by their implacable solidarity in the Scottsboro case. How emotional the times were! What comings together! What incitement! Out of college just three years at the time of the Scottsboro case, in 1931, I remember the almost weekly meetings. Especially do I remember one at which Alice Dunbar Nelson spoke, the widow of Paul Dunbar, a Negro poet nationally famous at the turn of the century. Mrs. Nelson had been one of my teachers in high school, and an old family friend. She was beautiful, tall with ivory skin, and a head of glinting red-gold hair and she was also of great and irresistible charm. One thought of her as being saturated in a serene culture, even in divinity. I doubt that she had ever been much concerned with the common run of Negroes, and that night as she spoke to a large audience of all classes of a united people, she was like a goddess come to earth, but a goddess. In the end, with tears glistening in her eyes, she stretched out her gloved hands and cried, Thank God for the Scottsboro case. It has brought us together. It was a thing to arouse even one constitutionally insensible to mass excitement, and I was not insensible, not in those days. I had found that out the year before. My second in the Deep South, a student of mine, was murdered, apparently in cold blood, by a white man or men. It happened in the late afternoon, in a section of Atlanta some distance from the college, and I knew nothing of it for several hours. But that night a colleague of about my own age rushed into my dormitory room without the usual courtesy of knocking come on he said gesturing vehemently we got to go i resented his bursting in on me we did not particularly care for each other anyway you might have knocked i said for christ's sake this is no time for the amenities he said we've got to go go where i'm not going anywhere to the meeting what meeting my God, man, don't you know that Dennis Hubert's been lynched? His eyes blazed like fires in a draft. He was greatly agitated. What? It must have been a yawp of horror and disbelief. The boy had sat in my class not five hours before. Lynched by some goddamn drunken crackers. The Negroes out in East Atlanta are getting together, and we're going to get together, too. We're not going to take this lying down. Those crackers might come out here any time. I could not follow his thinking, even after he reminded me that a relative, either an uncle or a cousin, of the murdered boy was on the college faculty. But the dangerous possibilities of those crackers coming bloomed in my imagination like poisonous flowers. And if they come, then what? I said. That's what we're having the meeting for. Come on. And I went. We were only a few, mostly younger instructors, and we tried to appear disciplined and resolute but hysteria was abroad, and I was caught up in it long enough to pledge to buy a gun through the underground means we had to employ, and long enough to be thrilled by the possession of it when it was delivered in great secrecy the next day, and even long enough to wish to use it on any skulking white man that offered. The college environs, and I suppose all the negro sections of the city, were like alerted camps. There were many false alarms. Cars loaded with white men were prowling the neighborhood, another student had been murdered some white youths had caught a negro girl coming from work stripped her of her clothes and chased her naked through the downtown streets and to match these were the heroics like guarding the house of the college president and of the hubert relative who was on the faculty every few days for a month negroes held meetings 
but after a time i did not go to them any more they came to seem like public displays of very private emotions in the same unbecoming taste of those obscene religious services in which worshippers handled snakes one day i took my gun and the box of bullets that came with it and rode out into the country and fired at a dead tree wrapped in greased gray flannel and a cardboard box the gun is still somewhere among my possessions but i have not seen it since End of section three section four of on being negro in america by j saunders redding this librivox recording is in the public domain many negroes will deny that the force which i have described as demonic has operated in their lives if asked about it they will take quick offence as if it were of the same stripe as an unnatural sex drive which of course is wisely kept secret by those who possess it they will aver that they live normal natural wholesome lives even in the south they will point out their normal interests in their professional lives and in their home lives they will tick off the list of their white friends they will say truthfully enough oh there are ways to avoid prejudice and segregation i have no quarrel with them nor with any others it is simply that i do not believe them having to avoid prejudice and segregation is itself unwholesome and the constant doing of it is skating very close to a psychopathic edge my experience has been that no two or three negroes ever come together for anything even so unracial a thing as say a christmas party but that the principal subject of conversation is race one grows mortally sick of it so in a sense partly through the writing of this essay i seek a purge a catharsis wholesome as all of us do perhaps unconsciously in one way or another i do this consciously feeling that i owe it to myself i need to do it for spiritual reasons as others need to seek god indeed there is a kind of god-seeking or at least an exorcism to observe one's feelings fears doubts ambitions hates to understand their beginnings and weigh them is to control them and to destroy their dominance by setting certain things down i hope to get rid of something that is unhealthy in me that is perhaps unhealthy in most americans and so face the future with some tranquillity also and finally i hope this piece will stand as the epilogue to whatever contribution i have made to the literature of race i want to get on to other things i do not know whether i can make this clear but the obligations imposed by race on the average educated or talented negro if this sounds immodest it must are vast and become at last onerous i am tired of giving up my creative initiative to these demands i think i am not alone i once heard a world-famous singer saying that as beautiful as the spirituals are and as great a challenge as they present to her artistry she was weary of the obligation of finding a place for them in every program as if they were theme music wholly identifying her she was tired of trying to promote in others and of keeping alive in herself a race pride that had become disingenuous and peculiar the spirituals belong to the world she said and yet i am expected to sing them as if they belong only to me and other negroes and as if i believe my talent is most rewardingly and truly fulfilled in singing them and i just don't think it necessarily is as a matter of fact she added she was having more and more trouble feeling her way into them i knew what she meant she could no longer be arrested in ethnocentric coils she did not wish to be the human spirit is bigger than that the specialization of the census and talent and learning more than three-fourths of the negro phds have done their doctoral dissertations on some subject pertaining to the negro that is expected of negroes by other members of the race and by whites is tragic and vicious and divisive i am tired of trying in deference to this expectation to feel my way into the particularities of response and reaction that are supposed to be exclusively negro i am tired of the unnatural obligation of converting such talent and learning as i have into specialized instruments for the promotion of a false concept called race this extended essay then is probably my last public comment on the so-called american race problem 
End of section four. Section five of On Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section five. Names have been given to the advocates and promoters of various racial policies. There are gradualists, and they are black and white, who feel that somehow, by a process of mechanical progression, everything will work out, though to what concrete ends they do not say. The race chauvinists advocate a self-sustaining Negro economic, social, and cultural island, and seem to have no fear of a destructive typhoon roaring in from the surrounding sea of the white world. The educationists believe that intellectual competence, as indicated, by the number of negro phi beta kappas doctors of philosophy and various experts will win for the race the respect it does not now receive there are the individualists who urge that each man work out for himself the compromises that will bring the self-fulfillment he seeks finally there are the radicals there are no degrees of radicalism among them who because they seem to see destruction as an end and would first uproot everything are actually nihilists. Various racial and biracial institutions look on themselves as representing and implementing one or the other of these policies. The Southern Regional Council, for instance, is gradualist. The Negro press is chauvinist. Most Negro Greek letter organizations, of which there are seven national and many dozen sectional and local, are educationalist. Howard University, though not its president, and the best-known private negro colleges are individualistic in their approach until its demise the national negro congress was radical but none of these is seamless pure and undefiled into each of them have seeped influences from one or more of the others in so far as the southern regional council believes in segregation and that is very far indeed it is chauvinistic and inasmuch as it sets a premium on intellectual growth as measured by scholarly achievement it is also educationalistic by the very circumstances of their founding private negro colleges lean towards chauvinism and they encourage this tendency further by courses in negro history art literature business and life recently moreover some negro colleges have spoken in favor of the south segregated regional education plan the private ones for reasons not clear the public ones because only segregation will save them from extinction the radicals who anyway take the position that radicalism is the highest brightest star in the ideological heavens are very proud of the intellectual caliber of paul robeson ben davis and that other davis john erstwhile president of the national negro congress the negro press of course reflects these conflicts and inconsistencies but something more fundamental than the contradictions accounts for the failures of these policies gradualism a habit of thought that marks interracial activities in the south is geared to the historic compulsion idea mentioned earlier it is mostly faith without works thunder without god and lengthy frequently fraudulent reports of victories as represented in the declines of lynchings and the long step forward nearly a generation in the taking from the holcutt case nineteen thirty two to the swiat case nineteen fifty as a principle gradualism is very flattering to the negro people it ascribes to them superhuman patience fortitude and humility in the face of very great social ills gradualism is laissez-faire a prescription of planning and foresight in the dynamics of society chauvinism is as impractical for the negro in america as it is fundamentally dangerous for any people anywhere even if negroes could duplicate the social and economic machinery and i doubt that they could the material resources on which their racial island must then depend would have to come from somewhere outside in a constantly shrinking world complete independence and isolation are impossible and even if they were not impossible for the negro in america would not the achieving of them result in permanent relegation to secondary status the very numbers involved that is the population ratio would assure it 
i cannot imagine the white majority saying sure come on and set up your self-sustaining household in a corner of my house there is still a great deal of race chauvinism and the fact would surprise no one negro organs of expression including scholarly journals documented pylon a review of race and culture published by atlanta university the journal of negro education published by howard university the journal of negro higher education published by johnson c smith university and journal of negro history published by the association for the study of negro life in history and a spate of lesser publications a purely emotional conviction informs chauvinism it is partly the frustrated pride that is expressed in negro history week observances which dichotomize united states history and in courses in negro literature and art which turn out to be valiant but then trickles forcibly and ingenuously divert it from the mainstream of american life chauvinism springs from a natural desire to find remission from the unequal struggle between black and white and surcease of discrimination the philosophy of the educationalist is only superficially different from that of the individualist the concepts in which they are hallowed seem only to obscure the fact that no man is completely the master of his fate only the immature fail to recognize that individual wishes now have almost no authority on the world educationalists and individualists acknowledge the existence of cooperative evils but deny the necessity to act cooperatively against them this is also it seems to me a denial of brotherhood a principle which must be made to operate in increasingly wider and wider arcs of human endeavor any statement of the individualist ideals would sound like a throwback to the time before theories of social compact or better social contract evolved the contradictions and conflicts in all this go deeper much deeper than any short general analysis can indicate they plunge their iron tentacles into the minds of individual negroes raggedly fragmenting them scoring them into oversensitized compartments it is this that we must understand when we think for instance of paul robeson and when we hear a negro college president declare himself opposed to segregation while at the same time he urges the state to add graduate courses to his already substandard curriculum so that negro aspirants to graduate degrees will not embarrass the state's white university and when we read on page one of a negro paper a vilification of white women who run after negro men and on the next page an encomium of a successful mixed marriage this is more than simply resiliency and accommodation and there is more than just negro heart and mind involved for the negro is not the problem in toto nor a problem in vacuo his behavior the patterns of his multiple personality the ebb and flow of action and counteraction and the agonizing ruptures in his group life result from the ill usage to which he is subject at the hands of american white people end of section five Section six of On Being Negro in America. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Looking back now, I know that the essence of these conflicts was distilled in my own boyhood home. My mother, who certainly would not have phrased it so, or even consciously thought it so, was an individualist. She was also the perfect embodiment of a type of Negro womanhood whose existence is still denied by those who cling to the old abasing habit of thought virtuous educated and noted for her beauty she lived her short life in a firm belief that the moral exercise of individual initiative imagination and will was enough to overcome the handicap of a colored skin i have before me now some lines she wrote obviously thinking of her sons and so you are a son of darker hue think then that god sees in your face a lesser image of his love and grace the ills of life all meant for you what light before you beckoning the iron will the open heart and mind the hope the wish the thought refine these compass points for a true reckoning these are not a full expression of her thought for there was enough of the chauvinist and enough of the sense of reality in her 
to make it clear that in her time except in the most unusual circumstances the limits of progress for the negro were within the negro world yet she spoke with pensive pride of howard drew who had been a great college athlete and who was then a hartford lawyer with an entirely white clientele and of maria baldwin the negro principal of the very estimable agassage school in cambridge where many harvard professors sent their children and of lillian evans madame avante who sang opera for a season at la scala and even though with less pride for the theatre was still suspect in her mind of bert williams but my father was different he took pride in such successes too but it irritated him that the knowledge of them was not more widespread he would have used them on the one hand as arguments against the white superiority theories of lathrop stoddard madison grant jerome dowd and on the other as arguments for his own theory that the negro could and should develop his own american culture i saw him brought to the verge of tears when the brown and stevens bank the richest and safest negro bank in the world failed back in the early twenties and this was not because he lost money in that disastrous collapse he didn't but because that failure cast dark shadows over the prospects of a self-sustaining negro culture he saw other shadows many times but he remained and now in his eighty-second year remains still in his heart i think a race chauvinist for him there was no incongruity between this and his insistence that his sons go east to a new england college through all the years of my boyhood my father was secretary of the wilmington delaware branch of the national association for the advancement of colored people secretary treasurer of the sarah ann white home now the Leighton home for aged colored people and a member of the board of the local negro y m c a which he helped found besides he had certain pet private projects like needling the truant officer for not making colored children go to school and upbraiding the police for permitting interracial vice to flourish in some negro neighborhoods and scolding fallen negro women and derelict negro men wherever he found them he was buoyant and earnest and uplifted in the prosecution of these activities what characters were drawn to our house how desperate they were i know now in their search for simplification and for that dignity of being that derives only from a sense of belonging for these simplicity and dignity are after all the true things for which men strive unable to attain them in a larger sense men slice life up into manipulatable segments institute policies of control reduced to some petty enslaving program and to slogans the great purposes of life america for americans for the advancement of colored people the true church and march uneasily toward their graves under the illusion that the particular distortion which they have been drawn is the straight and narrow path to salvation my father was like that i think that all the negroes i knew in my childhood were like that it was not altogether their fault it need not be pointed out that they had almost no say in determining the basic conditions under which they lived and that it was this common suffering that drew them together in the first place but subject to the common suffering was no mass man but classes and individuals and what they endured together they examined separately in the powerful lights of personal and class interests and ambitions and under these lights the caste principle which white society insisted on and to which the negroes were responding in the first place under these lights the caste principle broke down negroness was not itself enough the phrase we are all negroes together so often heard as a battle cry had only a sporadic potency within the negro group there were bitter conflicts and grave contradictions i remember when the tidal wave of garveyism swept over the walls my father had been hastily building against it he had not much warning as secretary of the wilmington delaware n a a c p he read and they studied the crisis the association's national organ he knew the official line was that marcus garvey was a mountebank and that his outfit swindlers preying on the poverty and ignorance of the lower classes do not the crisis said invest in the conquest of africa do not take desperate chances in flighty dreams 
my father knew also with increasing disquiet how fast the garvey following was growing but somehow he felt that only people of the slums could be attracted to it and he did not think of wilmington as having a real slum of course he was naif in this for a stone's throw east of our house began a noisome squalor of existence that spread like thick slime to the river when a sturdy hard-working citizen respected because he was hard-working and kept his children in school and did not let his insurance lapse came bringing my father an official invitation to join the garveyite line of march my father issued an urgent call to the members of the n a a c p for a meeting but it was too late for suddenly the garveyites were upon us they came with much shouting and blare of bugles in a forest of flags a black star centred in a red field they made speeches in the vacant lot where carnivals used to spread their tents they had a huge colourful parade and young women tensely sober of mean and plain even in their uniforms distributed millions of streamers bearing the slogan back to africa my father and i stood on the cross street below our house and watched the parade swagger by among the marchers my father spotted more than one advancer his turn even their wives and children they were not people of the slums they were people with small struggling clothes pressing shops and restaurants personal servants and what thomas j woofter jr calls black yeomen unlearned but percipient they had been dependable attendants at meetings promising negro uplift and loyal though perhaps somewhat awed members of the n a a c p some of them my father had personally recruited and low groans of dismay escaped him when he saw them in the line of march i was a boy but i remember and not so much because of the parade as for what happened after for the coming of the garveyites shattered the defensive bulwark around the protective community of negroes the whites did not understand this at first nor ever fully accustomed as they were to thinking of the negro as an undifferentiated caste they could not be expected to where there had seemed to be solidarity there were factions where there had been one leadership now there were more where it had been common to associate the force in the local negro world with individuals now the mass seemed to rear up faceless and where no spontaneous drive had seemed to exist now there was a hum of self-generating energy the whites did not understand but some of them found and took an advantage in our district which with only a scattered thirty per cent of the population white was fast becoming a ghetto negroes had enjoyed political control they had had no trouble electing one of their own to the school board and another to the city council the same men had been returned to office time and again what they did there and they did little seemed not nearly so important as just being there they had enormous prestige and influence among negroes and they had not had to fight to keep it but in the elections of that year they did directed by agents from new york the local garveyites put up their own candidates chosen on class lines the incumbents who in the common phrase were dictees found their following split the campaign smelled of pitch and brimstone and led to street brawls between the sadly outnumbered teenage children of the incumbent faction and the garveyites still the whites understood only enough of what was happening to give it burlesque treatment in the press but the agents from new york were professionals and their professionalism soon showed itself they made a deal with the white leaders in the ward before the negroes knew anything the whites had picked their own candidates and while negroes fought one another whites won the offices this was a blow but that is to put it mildly in our town as elsewhere in border states and northerly towns the pattern of a strong single negro leadership was fixed and so i suspect was the pattern of strong single polish and italian and jewish leadership and now the white people were in a quandary the pattern had been broken up they themselves had knocked down the stanchion that gave stability to race relations a bond issue was coming up and negro backing was indispensable to its success hitherto the white people had influenced the direction of negro thought through local negro leaders but who were the leaders now the white people needed them they felt uncomfortable and even frightened without them they needed to know and to control if possible 
what the negroes were thinking the race riots in northern cities washington chester chicago were still green in memory and wilmington itself had almost plunged into that civic horror congress just then was drumming up a bolshevist scare and congressman james burns of south carolina had called for indictments for sedition against certain national negro spokesmen but the negroes were equally lost and frightened by the immutable evidence of their own factionalism and frightened the more that white people knew of it so long as they could seem to maintain a solid front no matter what internal tensions already arrived at them they felt reasonably safe but now the white people can cut us up my father said we are divided it never occurred to him that the last thing in the world the white people wanted was a divided negro population enforced segregation and the caste system were proof that they did not my father who had spent more than two-thirds of his life above the mason dixon line hated segregation but he had developed the ghetto mind which made it bearable and safe a war of impulses was and is i fear going on all the time in both whites and negroes it is the symptom of an american psychological malady it is also an indictment of our culture and an offence against democracy many understand this now but most do not indeed most have built sophistic bulwarks against understanding they do not know this for the many small subtle fallacies which they abide through force of habit lessen their sense of moral conflict when they are faced with the great contradiction my father saying don't ever trust a white man is intent no different from the white man saying all niggers look alike to me the phrases represent the lowest common denominator in the american race experience they are the essence of empiricism they voice experiences so debased and so bereft of humaneness as utterly to discredit our way of life in the eyes of the world they deny the inspiring first principle of democracy that the person counts as person no matter what his color or creed son my father said the night before i went east to college remember you're a negro you'll have to do twice as much twice better than your classmates before you act think how what you do may reflect on other negroes those white people will be judging the race by you don't let the race down son i've no memory of protesting this terrible burden laid on my mind and heart indeed i am sure i did not what my father said checked with what i had been taught to feel my father went on out east you may feel it less because there are fewer negroes or for the same reason you may feel it more some say one thing some the others but no matter where you go in this country you'll never get away from being made to know that you are a negro yes sir i said we're aliens in an alien land and yet he fought the garveyite's dream of going back to africa and had applauded the deportation of emma goldman on every day of national memorial had hung out the flag and when the breezes of may the suns of july and the snows of february rent and seared it he bought another but there's some purpose in it he went on wearily god works in mysterious ways there's certainly some purpose so do your best remember you're a negro i'll remember i said knowing that i would because i had been well and exactly taught because such lessons thrust deep but feeling even then i like to think the iron unfairness of it perhaps even drawing a sorry comfort from it let many a negro boy before and since for after all it is a ready-made excuse more it is a license for all of us to live in that blind egoistic immaturity which even under the most wholesome learning we are reluctant to forego anyway twice as much twice better a negro's just as good as anybody else my father said but he's always got to prove it thus burdened i went off to college End of section six. Section 7 of On Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The assumptions that were held valid in my childhood were all wrong. So much has been said about them that I mention them reluctantly, but their strength is attested by the fact that many, many still trust them, and not 
merely southern whites and the misinformed and the ignorant nor whites alone but blacks hodding carter novelist and pulitzer prize-winning journalist no doubt deserves his reputation as a southern liberal but only a few months ago he wrote of a common insistence upon white political domination in the south which is as unbreakable as anything woven by the mind of man and declared himself unalterably committed to race segregation on the ground of preserving the white race ethnic integrity somewhat earlier the georgia commissioner of agriculture had said the yellow people the brown people and the blacks not even bothering to add people are mentally unfit for directors in our form of government in 1951 Kerr scott the governor of north carolina most liberal state in the south echoed the georgian asked by a negro reporter why his inaugural promise had been fulfilled only to the extent of making one negro appointment the governor snapped if i were you i'd never have asked that question i have given you people more than you can handle that's why i tell you you should never have asked that question so the old assumptions hold the assumption of the negro's inherent inferiority of tragic social and cultural consequences if segregation is broken down on anything but the most superficial levels the negroes preferring segregation and many more they were taken on in the first place as rationalizations by means of which the white man tried as gunner Merdell says to build a bridge of reason between his acclaimed egalitarian creed and his countervailing deed because of this guilt-ridden adoption they were the more avidly loved they are also the more furiously drummed into the general consciousness where reverberating like thunder in a valley they have rolled out the tune to which white people and negroes have danced since nineteen hundred the negroes because they must it is a static but a curiously hectic dance we gyrate through its complicated patterns with responses as conditioned and involuntary as reflexes in spite of all the fervent clapping and shouting our reactions to the race problem are not really emotional and intellectual but muscular i cannot now as long ago i could believe in the moral and intellectual conviction of the demagogues of men like richard russell and james burns and strom thurmond for i cannot believe that the findings of modern science are so cabined and confined even in south carolina georgia and mississippi as to escape the knowledge of these educated men the older demagogues had this to excuse them they were ignorant the younger ones are knowing puppeteers cynically manipulating the strings of the past and even the masses who respond to the strings know better than they used to even with them conviction flags and cynicism takes over the moral conviction that it was for the social welfare that they reserved all power to themselves no longer operates power for power's sake is now the rule and when a leading georgia politician said so in a political address the rafters rang we have the power and we mean to keep it where it belongs if the negroes vote wholesale and if the county unit system goes we'll have that much less power but it must not go the county unit system which used to protect our rural population from slick city politics now arms us all with power against the enemies of white supremacy the old assumptions hold but worse others have been added to evade the knowledge that cannot now be ignored and to make possible the conformity to the vicious dialectic of power which rings as plangently in america now as in the rest of the world and the chief of them is this that hostility is the accepted state in which to live dualism is looked on as the natural division of absolute opposites of enemies communism and democracy eastern man and western man native and foreign and most pertinent to this argument black and white not black as formerly the pathetically weak and erring child of nature nor white as formerly the tolerant chastiser and protector the strong adult but black raised by the findings of science and the decisions of the highest court in the land to close equality with white and therefore the enemy to white exaggerated but toward truth not away from it that competition which was once confined to the lowest economic levels and which resulted in the legendary hatred of the poor white masses for the negro and vice versa 
operates on higher levels now it is on the level of skilled labor as the brotherhood of locomotive engineers and firemen knew when they brought suit to enjoin railroads from promoting negro firemen also members of the brotherhood to engineers it is on the level of education and persons reporting to be students of a medical college of the university of south carolina admitted sending threatening letters to a negro applicant and burning a cross on his front lawn it is on the level of the professions so that a committee of the national bar association a negro group felt constrained to report that as the quality of training rises negro lawyers find it harder to win admission to the bar in some southern states actually of course it is no longer possible to predicate discrimination and segregation on negro inferiority so long as it was possible and seemed forever possible the practical minded found a kind of social justification in disenfranchisement in raising economic and cultural barriers in the despotic paternalism which said thou shalt not even the negro leader booker washington found it blameless and indeed good without ever suspecting that the tradition of noblesse oblige on which all this was claimed to be founded might some day be as ineffective as necromancy segregation was order it was control it was the steel and concrete casing sealing up a devastating social explosion it still seems so to the vast majority and their leaders the strongest voices in the south today say that segregation must be kept governor james burns in his inaugural was not so intent on expressing his views on foreign policy that he did not assure his listeners of his unaltered opposition to the fair deal hotting carter the liberal mentioned above is not so liberal that he does not see it as tragic for the south the negro and the nation itself if segregation is done away with and only a fool lillian smith quotes from the atlanta constitution would say the southern pattern of separation of the races can or should be overthrown but if segregation must be kept it must now be predicated on something else than negro inferiority and what else is there the cynical ideology of power worship what h a overstreet calls the fight and grab image the philosophy of hate it is what hitler came to it is the result of a pattern of thinking desperately threatened by science and social change end of section seven Section 8 of On Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8. I am an integrationist. I have been for a long time. It is not a principle that I arrived at through intellection. Until the past few years, I did not bring to bear on it whatever intelligence I have. I felt my way to it, just as some men, in spite of obstructing experience, feel their way to ideals of honesty sobriety and continence nor was the feeling of my way wholly conscious it was rather like the action of one who kicks and splashes frantically to save himself from drowning and suddenly finds that he has reached a shelf on which he can stand in the river bed his objective was not the shelf but just to be saved i kicked and splashed in all directions and suddenly there i was i was an integrationist when the communists camped almost nightly on my trail in the early 1930s and lighted beckoning bright fires in the frightening dark of that time. I did not believe then, any more than now, that the moment the bars of segregation are lifted all the white women of the South will fall into the arms of Negro mates. Many of my acquaintances gleefully profess to believe this, would just as gleefully declare that Negroes lynched for rape had been only unlucky in being caught with their always willing white paramours. They found substance for this opinion in both fact and fiction, which too loudly proclaimed the revulsive feeling of the white female for the negro, and the inviolable purity of white womanhood. My acquaintances believe that southern whites protested too much. And so, it seems, did the communists, or perhaps they did not, it could have been just a line in the carrying out of explicit directives on how to recruit negroes in the eastern states 
it could have been that they were played expertly on what they thought were the secret dreams of a young green mixed-up and lonely man i suppose all people suffer from these maladies and especially from youth and early adulthood and i had more besides i had a severe case of negrophophilia which alternately wrenched my heart with hate and love i was confused about the direction of my life and extremely doubtful as i sometimes am to-day of life's purpose whether naturally or through learning i shrank from all but a handful of people and some of these were a disappointment to me and i have no doubt that i was a sore trial to them i lacked social accommodation i have never thought tolerance admirable as a principle either of adjustment or feeling and i rejected it entirely for my friends dogs were to be tolerated and crying babies and strangers with whom one did not have to become acquainted my friends were constantly not living up to my foolish expectations my judgments were severe i was continually breaking with them and rejoining them but with no increase in understanding i do not think i would have become a communist even had these deficiencies not been in me but certainly except for them the communists would have had an easier time assailing my weak position on the extreme left flank of democracy the wrong scouts came to reconnoitre and they took the wrong approach the first who came was a moist sleazy fellow fat and asthmatic i had often seen him in the little restaurant where i took dinner frequently he would be there in low-voiced conversation with various people men and women when i entered he always sat at the round family table back in the corner at an angle from the door and my glance would fall there first there would be beer before him and it was just legal again and a dish of olives and olive pits and a plate of fried potatoes which he ate with his fingers though i did not think he was aware of me no one could be unaware of him even from my table by the window with my back squarely toward him i was conscious of his presence in lulls of dish rattling and conversation his wheeze could be heard all over the tiny restaurant one evening when i came there later than usual because i had waited for a cold rain to stop and took my place eric the german waiter told me that philip wanted to talk to me he indicated the fat man at the big table there was little possibility of eric's having made a mistake the restaurant had only a dozen tables and it catered to a limited and steady patronage of unimportant executives clerks and apprentices from the jewelry manufactories and a few plebeian graduate students like myself i do not remember ever seeing another negro there even though eric had made no mistake i was sure that i did not want to talk to philip but before i could put my thoughts into words and summon the courage to utter them philip was standing there he looked at me expressionlessly as he pulled the chair far out to allow for his pendulous belly and sat down this rain my friends are all late tonight," he said you'll excuse me there was nothing questioning or tentative or apologetic in the way he spoke i was acutely embarrassed he took a piece of potato out of the dish he had brought with him and carried it to his mouth it was a small full-lipped mouth his hands too i noticed were small and very white though the nails and the knuckles were dirty in contrast to his moist flushed face what does the j in your name represent he asked i was taken by surprise it must have shown it for he blew out an indulgent laugh you wouldn't think i would know your name this was not a question either i do and he spoke it the sound of it coming from a complete stranger seemed to establish some kind of power over me i felt a twinge of fright even as if i were suddenly vulnerable in ways i knew not of how do you know he swung his head from side to side and his face smiled at me i know and i know more he said he called off items of biographical fact as if he were reading from a file card the year and place of my birth my father's name my brother's name my schooling an attack of scarlet fever i had had momentarily i half expected him to go into an account of monstrous crimes i had committed in some other and unremembered character it seems silly now for i know that to get such information as he had was an easy matter but then i felt that for some dark purpose i could not guess a million pairs of eyes had followed me since birth i do not wish to play up this episode nor to dramatize my reaction to it 
for what followed was ridiculous emotional anticlimax through the next talk philip had with me a week or so later his efforts to get on terms of easy familiarity dissipated my sense of being mysteriously overpowered and exposed i did not respond to the first name camaraderie not knowing his last name i avoided calling him anything i think my formal civility frustrated him and i think this is why in a kind of desperation during the third or fourth meeting he pulled out a folder of very detailed obscene photographs and handed them to me he laughed when he asked in pretended casualness for i could feel him watching me sharply whether i had seen anything like them before and weren't they the most amusing things and one in particular because he knew the girl in it a student at the art school he had some delicious friends he said and he would like me to meet them he said that there was one bonnie brunette especially from way down in georgia but completely and i mean completely emancipated and without prejudice they lined up fast enough once they were really free he said and it only went to show what would happen to the race problem all over the country were it not for the strength and pressure of reaction there just wouldn't be any of it if it were left to the women i think philip was running way ahead of his timetable or to change the figure he had cast his net on the wrong side there was not enough weight to it in any case i knew later that there was quite a potential catch of assorted fish including a young college student who wore very thick glasses a french descendant politician who had considerable power in local labor circles and a very wealthy widow in her late thirties even then the widow was contributing generously to the south and some years later she became nationally known as pro-communist there were others too but i do not know how they had been approached nor how many were caught perhaps philip and those who joined him in subsequent weeks fumbled the assignment badly at least this one got away the approach to my intellect is not through my gonads one approach perhaps is through my curiosity and it was curiosity that teased me into going here and there with philip i wanted to see what kind of people these were i had listened to soapbox communists on the streets of new york but they had aroused nothing in me save vague speculations over such questions as were brooded about in those days what was wrong with our government did the rich and powerful think only to gain more power and reap more benefits from the exploitation of the working class what should the government do what could it do what was hoover doing that he should not do and vice versa i felt a certain shallow contempt for the emotionalism the unreasoning bitterness and the actless anger of the soapbox radicals i do not know whether it was because they were a cohesive motley of white americans negroes italians portuguese and french but i liked better the brazen self-interest of the radical workers whom i had seen milling about the shut-down what an ominous word that was blank-walled factories in southwest providence but i could not identify with them either they talked of violence and did violence as once when the police tried to scatter them in an implacable matter-of-fact way that repelled me i've never believed in violence i have heard negroes advocated i once knew of a group of negroes who organized to kill a white man every time a negro was lynched they called themselves the quick cure club incorporated in grim parody of the ku klux klan they were to have branches in every principal city of the south though it was rumored and is still widely believed among negroes that the violent and unsolved murder of a constable in green county missouri in the nineteen thirties was the work of the black k k k i think the organization never really got started nor could i identify myself in more than a superficial way with the campus group of intellectual radicals with whom a common interest in writing brought me into contact they were enthusiastic and well-meaning but quite innocent and harmless they knew considerably more about john reed haywood brown and h l mencken than about marx lenin and the and the deviationism of trotsky they knew something about nietzsche too and they were learning google something about freud but the german philosopher's will to power was not translated into political terms and freud's civilization and its discontents which had only recently appeared in this country 
was simply a yardstick by which they measured their imaginary personal gripes against smugness and conservatism theirs was the rebellion of youth they talked a lot what they said was mostly brilliant nonsense which had no more relation to the actual destruction of the bridges over which their parents had passed than a pyrotechnic display on a moonless night only one of them became a writer a humorist and a good one his latest book now lies before me sensitive talented some of them wealthy they turned out to be thoroughly conservative college professors investment brokers and lawyers who had no trouble making a peace with things as they are my problems were different from theirs the drive self-preservation anxiety vanity sex the complete discharge of strength nietzsche speaks of were considerably modified by my negroness such an admission is embarrassing to make but i recognized its truth even then self-preservation for example was not a galvanic drive in me nor in other negroes i knew i have written elsewhere that five of my closest acquaintances committed suicide in the span of six red and terrible years pride and vanity were excessive since negroes were assumed to be sexually immoderate i made a show of strict asceticism chastising the flesh in a way most unnatural to youth what i did not recognize was that i was being forced into the narrowest egocentrism into an involvement with self that was morbid beyond reason and that only the lucky are able to sublimate and this only partially into group concern and with extreme luck wider social concern it needed not be said and certainly not in the way of apology that this is not altogether the fault of the negro it is the fault also of the american life situation neither quite an accidental wickedness nor a complex of impersonal coercions over which both the individual and the group control of minority people is limited the campus group of intellectual radicals broadened me they stimulated my reading my imagination my sympathies to the reading of james santayana and de unamono to whom professor ducasse had introduced me i added nietzsche especially thus spake zarathustra and marx and much else that i would not have come across in the ordinary routine of my graduate study but i was not broadened enough to take what philip and his circle offered had their first offering stayed on the level of the first parties i attended with philip matters might have been different i could take any amount of talk and there ran through their rapid-fire conversations phrases that exploding like firecrackers drew my attention the political state as distinct from the economic and social state they were drawing such distinctions then the omnicompetent state responsibility in areas of cultural autonomy of course i had ideas as to meanings but nothing they said really coalesced into concepts i was not moved either to agreement or disagreement i simply heard in later meetings however i began to listen and to understand but not what it was expected i would understand rather the opposite i began to comprehend that they talked like people who had a vested interest in a democratic catastrophe it was not communism's strength and validity its constructive and health-seeking activities on which they based their argument it was on democracy's weaknesses they rejoiced in the economic depression because they saw in it the beginning of democracy's total collapse the ideal they said was security and freedom and i agreed with this but under your system they were talking directly to me and to hakley a young but grizzled silversmith apprentice there is neither they were too smart actually to make capitalism and democracy synonymous so i could judge only that this equating one with the other was a deliberate effort to confuse and i was confused and i showed it in childish exasperation at the way in which they pointed out with a kind of glib cold fervor every weakness every failure every instance of corruption and discrimination and injustice and how these affected one personally and especially the negro the inference was plain that in the omnicompetent state the service state which were equated these things would not be but when i pressed for proof of their inferences philip and the intellectual leaders of the cell withdrew into taunts and challenges and were not percipient enough to see how dangerously they threatened my self-esteem the idea of democracy was itself not particularly dear to me then 
but i resented the doubts cast on my inherited assumptions about it if anything i resented democracy for leaving me and itself so defenceless but i hated communism for putting me on the defensive my anger and frustration carried over from one meeting to the next for though their arguments were basically weak i had no answers to them after the fifth meeting i was certain that i was through with the communists and all their works but i did not figure on the prose lighting passion of philip and honey this latter was one of the five women in the cell whom i had seen regularly at meetings honey was a cell nickname and it suited only her physical appearance among her colleagues at the city hospital where she told me she worked as a technician she was known as bronca i never learned her last name of foreign extraction austrian or czech i judged she had soft honey blonde hair worn in a long bob so that when she turned or lowered her head a wave of hair fell across her face it was a good face not pretty and decorated but well structured and strong with pale yellow eyes set under square brows she talked a great deal in a rather strident and insolent tone and she laughed a lot insolently too both her laughter and her talk seemed to come from very near the surface yet one felt that she had depths sometimes one was as hard put to follow the erratic train of her thought as to follow her restless vital movements philip and honey came to my lodging-house one night after i had twice failed to show up at meetings it was embarrassing to have them come there for my landlady though she had been born and had lived all her life in new england and though she thought that this was in itself some sort of victory or credit for a negro my landlady was only less suspicious of white people than she was of negroes who consorted with them even had they desired it my visitors could not have come in so i went with them to the two untidy rooms which honey occupied over a delicatessen in the oldest and a step from genteel section of the city there were just the three of us and over a bottle of very sour wine which was called dago red they questioned me about my absences i told them that i had been preparing for mid-year examinations which was true and anyway was i to consider myself obligated to be present at every cell meeting they looked at each other for a moment then honey laughed deliciously and said of course not and philip laboriously wheezed an echo of this in cell meetings philip was the centre but here honey had complete charge she led the talk into all sorts of trivial channels shifting restlessly in her chair tossing her head crossing and uncrossing her legs honey talked and talked her vitality and the wine were exhilarating she was profane and final in her judgments of people she jokingly accused philip of trying to bring into the cell some profound asses some absolutely untouchable unteachables like a certain sydney she mentioned who was positively she said a reconditioned pervert oh she was sure of it and fay harriston this was the wealthy widow who every day jumped into a barrel of peroxide and who for all her efforts at femininity showed that she was a conditioned hermaphrodite laughing gaily honey wanted to know what philip was doing recruiting people for his own pleasure was that what he was making of the cell a circle of lesbians and libertines unembarrassed and unsmiling philip only shook his head and after a time honey went on to something else the atmosphere was very casual very friendly and i was sorry when philip announced that he must leave it was my cue to go too and i got up there was a moment's hesitation before philip said oh but i'll be back you wait for me here i looked at honey but she was already reclaiming the hat i had picked up i thought she smiled mockingly at philip what honey and i talked about after philip's departure i do not know in my notebook the next day i wrote exactly what follows i wish i could make out a case of moral rectitude for myself but i cannot what i kept thinking of last night was all the possible consequences when honey came and sat on the couch too close to me i remembered all i had heard about parlor whores that they were bold and brazen and without discrimination and that they were bound to be diseased i had never had more than a dozen words with her until last night so there was no affection for me there was only passion and even this may not have been genuine i half wished it were or that i could think it so my feeling was that her object was to arouse passion in me while she kept herself out of it and under control she shivered and rolled her head against my shoulder and dug her nails into my thigh but i think that it was all fake 
I do not know what we talked about between times, or whether we talked about anything. But if she were outside it, I was outside it too, and I kept thinking that Honey had some ulterior motive, and that she was trying to realize it at too high a price. I knew that she wanted me to have sex relations with her, and I knew also that I would not, could not, dared not. I do not think she tempted me at all, really. She just frightened me. I did not see how anyone could go to such a length to obtain a result that in the long run could have almost no importance. Certainly I cannot think myself that important to the communist. And suppose this were not her reason. Then what? Just sex? I cannot trust a white woman that way, no matter how willingly a white woman gives herself to a colored man. If she is found out, she will yell rape. Last night I pictured newspaper headlines, such as I have seen many times, and I thought of them referring to me, black brute. I did the right thing last night, though maybe I did it for all the wrong reasons. I fled. Though I knew I had done the right thing, I was ashamed to see Honey and Philip again, for I convinced myself that I had been naif and cowardly. I did not go back to the little restaurant at the bottom of the hill. Once I had a note from Philip, and once he, or someone very like him, inquired of me from my landlady, but I did not see him, nor Honey, nor any of the people I used to see in the cell. I am certain that Honey, laughing with strident insolence, spoke of me as one of Philip's untouchable unteachables, and pretty quickly forgot me. End of section 8section nine of on being negro in america by j saunders redding this librivox recording is in the public domain section nine but i did not forget communism then or later in new york the next year nineteen thirty three the party was quite fashionable among my acquaintances some of whom took it seriously one could be sure that among the guests at harlem's middle and upper class social gatherings would be white people and that these were admitted communists or fellow travelers at least some of them were said to be well known in avant-garde and esoteric circles in in the theatre but i had never heard of most of them and i am inclined to think that the reputations they were given in harlem were a kind of defence in depth against the allegation that the only whites negroes could mingle with socially were peripheral people nobody's tramps the white people I met at such parties seemed average intellectual types. I was struck by the fact that they did not talk communism, but gave the impression of living on a higher and freer level than American democracy afforded. The atmosphere they created was easy and sophisticated, with a high sexual content of which, it was said, nearly everyone took advantage. No one bothered to whisper the stories of liaisons between white women and negro men, and negro women and white men they were accepted without shock and the actors in these little dramas seemed to play their roles with a lack of embarrassment and even a natural grace that fascinated me i do not think any of the communists i met in these circumstances were seriously political minded certainly they were not party workers they did not make speeches from flag-draped stepladders wedged against curbings as so many communists were doing daily in front of the home relief stations scattered over the city they did not rustle up meetings nor belong to instructional cells nor try to indoctrinate any one they were not of the soiled shirt sinkers and coffee brigade my negro acquaintances would not have had them in their homes if they had been communism is merely the rose under which they pursued more pleasurable activities there were a good many hastily printed communist leaflets being passed out in those days i seemed to get them all i also read them they were slanted for the middle-class negro the professional the intellectual the student with only half an eye one could see that the party was conducting a campaign to recruit a potential educated negro leadership the labor masses had been a disappointment to the communists who anyway employed the wrong methods to enlist them negro labor was far from ready for the proletarian revolution it was not class struggle but race struggle that interested them what the negro labor masses wanted was to be treated as a special case first they wanted job security they wanted to be brought up to the level of white workers before they could march in the ranks with them toward the bigger communist goal equality first and then integration 
besides negro labor had the same suspicion of communism that it had of socialism and trade unionism a suspicion of being used rather than helped and used for the establishment of an order of things that was not quite clear so the new recruitment was to be among the class of which i was an inconsequential representative the communists were determined not to make the same mistake twice equality land and freedom a program for negro liberation issued by the league of struggle for negro rights in nineteen thirty three put it this way the task that confronts the party in organizing the negro workers and rallying them for the daily class struggle side by side with the white workers is no light one the negro evinces no militant opposition toward communism but he wants to know how it can improve his social status what bearing does it have on the common practice of lynching political disenfranchisement segregation industrial discrimination the negro is revolutionary enough in a racial sense in short he is race conscious and this was enough to concentrate on in the late nineteen twenties and the early nineteen thirties the communists got some good advice from somewhere they also took advantage of two circumstances the angelo herndon case was still bubbling and boiling and the scottsboro case was just reaching another of its vociferous climaxes in nineteen thirty three the international labor defense was formed in those days and i met william l patterson its secretary next to james d ford the communist party's vice presidential nominee in nineteen thirty two patterson held the highest rank of any negro in the party but i was not impressed by him he seemed of small intellectual caliber though very ambitious and bold i was more impressed by a well-known and engaging negro journalist he just returned from russia and i suppose a period of indoctrination when i met him backstage at the fourteenth street theatre where stevedore was playing i can remember his saying to me we negro writers have a great opportunity and an inflexible duty to promote the revolution that will extirpate caste class and race how flattering we negro writers to lump me in with langston hughes claude mckay jean toomer rudolph fisher county cullen and himself all of them talented all of them well known he could not possibly have heard of me i had written and published professionally only one story at that time but the negro art and literary renaissance had not waned enough for those close to it to see that it was fading and now and then a completely unknown student i basked in that artificial light like a homeless beggar keeping himself warm over a sidewalk grating but communism gave off a light of a different quality it had no comfort in it as harsh and as revealing as the light in a surgical operating room it cast no cosy shadow into which one could slip for those moments of quiet reflection which seemed as necessary to me as food and drink communism did not allow for the play of individual thought and initiative it had no warmth in it or perhaps it is untrue to say this since intense heat and intense cold produce the same primary reaction a shriveling up a drawing out until the living thing loses its own identity becomes one with the heat or the cold i saw something of this reaction in new york and i was appalled by it or perhaps this too is untrue perhaps what appalled me was the realization that there were people who felt themselves so helplessly cast out of american society and democratic reckoning that they could suck with voracious hunger at the cold breast of communism one of the things i could not understand was this unquestioning submission to control i do not mean to give the impression that i met many avowed negro communists i did not not more than a half dozen in all but with one of them i had nearly seven months of close association he had a room next to mine in the place where i was living and we shared a bath he was a thief he did not make his living in this way he had to do with the stock and delivery room of a garment making firm he told me and he was a minor official in a local union of either truckers or garment makers i do not know which he was a thief solely for the benefit of the party that was his party work and his duty and he served it blindly it was a strange work at more or less regular intervals he stole bolts of cloth suitings was his word and kept them in his room until someone seldom the same person twice 
identify himself by some prearranged means made contact and relieved him of the goods he never knew what happened to them ultimately curiously enough this was almost the only information about himself clark we will call him ever volunteered and of course i did not know this at first what i did know about clark but only after probing was that he came originally from pennsylvania and had been graduated from a high school in one of the towns in that state when the c c c agency was organized he applied for a mission to one of the work groups but was rejected because high school was supposed to have given him a vocation by means of which he could earn a living caught in the depression without money and i gathered without stable family connections he drifted for a while to pittsburgh to philadelphia and finally to new york he was a rugged-looking stiff-faced young man of twenty-four or twenty-five one would never suspect from his appearance or from his unimpassioned manner of speaking what a steady flame of fanaticism burned in him he did not talk well his voice was coarse his tongue slightly thick and he had a very limited command of the language he spoke of this one day after we had got to know each other fairly well i wish i could talk like you he said i was about to protest that i was no model when he added or like james ford this was a complete letdown for me i had both seen and heard james ford when he was stumping the eastern seaboard for the league of struggle for negro rights and i did not think much of him he seemed basically ignorant like a parrot fluently repeating phrases he had been carefully taught his manner seemed gross james ford if i could talk like him maybe i could be where he is now clark said and where is he i generally wanted to know i had heard nothing of him since his farcical campaign as the communist party's vice presidential candidate i don't know but i think he's in russia clark said you want to go to russia but why what's this country ever done for me what am i here he asked impassively a nigger anybody can spit on in russia i could be a man this too came without anger or bitterness and i could understand it he was giving idiomatic expression to a simple wish for dignity and self-respect one heard it so often among negroes that one was likely to forget the deep wound of denial which it covered like a scab i know a fellow who went to russia i said brightly apparently he likes it he's never come back he's got the right idea i wouldn't come back neither if i ever went doesn't appeal to me i said you've been listening to the guys on the step ladder the reds across the street clark gave me then a long slow look but there was nothing in it that i could detect no quickening either of speculation or resentment i'm a communist he said i laughed with surprise and embarrassment and still with his pacifies on me he said again i'm a communist bluntly there was nothing to say and so i kept silent and to keep silent with clark was like nothing so much as expecting to be talked to by a wall he went to his own room shortly the next day when we met i felt a little twinge of embarrassment but he seemed not to and the feeling soon passed though i did not know it then i talked to clark for next to the last time less than a month later he came to my room one night as he often did but this time he announced phlegmatically that he was in trouble he neither looked nor sounded like a man in trouble and i could think only that he was in trouble with a girl though girls had never been a subject of conversation between us what kind of trouble i inquired i suppose clark lacked a certain sensitiveness though i would not have called him callous i do not think it was because he did not care it was just that he could not estimate the effect his words had upon others i am a thief and i think they suspicion me he said i must have said something like oh go on or quit kidding but i knew he had no sense of humor and was quite incapable of kidding i looked at him he seemed to think i had not heard him i'm a thief and i think they suspicion me he repeated and when he took me to his room and showed me a flat top trunk half full of bolts of cloth i believed him but what are you going to do with this stuff if they suspect you and come i'm going to get shut of it he said stoically i'm going to get shut of it now in a few minutes he was stuffing the bolts of cloth into two battered valises 
what are you going to do how are you going to get rid of it this time he did not answer but swung the valises off the bed brushed past me and went down the hall the next time and the last time i talked with clark he was in the ninth precinct jail he was arrested on a saturday on sunday a newspaper reporter who covered the precinct telephoned me saying that clark wanted to see me i did not like it i was vexed by the fear of somehow becoming involved in his trouble i went with reluctance the desk sergeant i thought eyed me suspiciously when i asked for clark but perhaps it was just my nervousness for he called another officer who taking a key led me through some doors and along a tier of empty cells clark was in the last cell on the tier and he must have heard us coming for i found him standing expectantly he smiled stiffly when he saw me but waited until the policeman had gone before he spoke they got me he said my mood was not pleasant i'm afraid nor talkative i had no wish to draw him out if he had anything to say to me i thought then he would damn well say it without help from me he was still smiling stiffly they got me he said again so i see i said now what they were holding him for a preliminary hearing on monday he said then as if it were something which did not concern him as if he were speaking of someone else who was altogether a stranger to him he told me of his work for the communists as i have related it above i could not understand it i stared at him for what he was saying sounded crazy especially to be coming in so calm and uninflected a voice but why i wanted to know it was my job he said as if that explained it truly and entirely as if it completely satisfied the demands of my question what did you send for me for i can't do anything for you i said somebody's made a fool of you let them look out for you you got it all wrong he said shaking his head slowly you've got it all wrong you're in jail i said bitingly but i ain't no fool unless doing things for a good point is one and i don't want nobody to look out for me well if you did somebody else would have to do it what could they do you want me to get them in trouble you mean the communists my action group he said they can't do nothing they ain't supposed to do nothing i stared at him with even greater intensity they know and they won't even go bail for you or get you a lawyer my outraged credulity was as lost on him as my vexation had been i told you he said you mean it's supposed to be this way you knew that if something like this happened your action group wouldn't do anything i ain't going to drag nobody else in he said doggedly they shouldn't have to be dragged in i said and i think i raised my voice in exasperation they ought to come in you wrong he said but you're the one who's in jail i could not believe that what was happening to him could happen of course i had heard stories of strict party discipline of orders being given to party members to do what no one in his right mind would do but i did not believe such stories though they were common and though they were also congruous with the newspaper accounts of the purges that were then taking place in russia i had my reservations but this business with clark was real he was somebody i knew and this was happening to him look i said why don't you be sensible why don't you he was shaking his head before i could finish there seemed to be nothing i could say to arouse him to a true recognition of the fix he was in perhaps at bottom he had a martyr complex but i could not see in him any of the things i associated with martyrdom there was none of the fire none of the dignity and nobility i thought of as belonging in the picture there were not even defiance and rebellion in him or if there were clark kept them hidden beneath layers of stony reserve that could not be penetrated besides it seemed to me that to have to suffer alone for a principle made the principle suspect and he suffered alone i did not go to see him in the tombs where he was remanded after the preliminary hearing and on the day of his trial i searched four papers before i found in one of them a short notice negro convicted of theft i saw him again at the trial it lasted less than twenty minutes clark in the same rumpled brown suit he had worn in jail was led in he looked slightly drawn but i think i was the only one of the twenty or thirty spectators who could have known this no one seemed to take any interest in this fourth case on the docket the charge was read 
the court-appointed lawyer pleaded guilty a short stocky man was sworn in and gave testimony to the effect that so many and so many bolts of cloth were missing over a period of months that company detectives were put on the trail of them and that finally in march they had found their man then a private detective testified then a stock clerk there were no other witnesses clark was ordered to stand the judge pronounced sentence five years in prison clark looked around at the spectators then but i could see no change in his expression he was nudged away i left the courtroom end of section nine Section 10 of Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 10. Like the capacity for thought and the desire for knowledge, the instincts for personal liberty and, within reason, power over one's destiny are attributes of the human mind. They are stronger in some than others. Where they have been weakened by catastrophe, say long-continued planned violence as in war or widespread social disorganization as in times of great economic crises the instincts can be perverted or even totally destroyed there was danger of this perversion which actually developed in some countries in europe during america's great depression when the feeling grew that only franklin d roosevelt had answers and that everything depended on him the american people were all but ripe to surrender their minds and the control of their destiny it was the distortion or atrophy of this instinct that the communists hoped to find in the american negro they had good reason for such hopes and they were not loath to express it the especially intense exploitation and heavy oppression to which the millions of negroes in america are subject make it imperative for the party to devote its best energies and its maximum resources toward becoming the recognized leader and champion of negroes the intense exploitation and heavy oppression were true enough but there was something that the communists did not take into account something psychical and perhaps unworldly which even the people whom they hoped to inveigle did not think about it was not the negroes wanted resiliency though this was something rather it was what i think of only as the spiritual cohesion of democracy this cohesion is organic to the delicately balanced ideological structure that democracy is and it is the attribute which makes it impossible to separate the destiny of america from the destiny of democracy itself for democracy is less a form of government than it is a way of life and the principles freedom equality justice on which this way of life is founded have an appeal as universal as the idea of god and what i am saying is that in spite of heavy oppression and intense exploitation the american negro believed in the principles it was this belief in the principles and the impossibility of ever dissociating them in the negro's mind from democracy in america that stymied the communists who could not understand why the colored people's hatred of discrimination segregation and all the inequities did not lead naturally to a hatred of democracy but it was like expecting them to hate god because preachers are sometimes rascals nor do i think that this is as abstruse and metaphysical as it sounds or if it is then it is well to remember that american democracy is itself a metaphysic blending as it does subjective truth the inalienable rights of man with moral abstractions liberty and justice for all and mystical concepts the will of the people which admittedly cannot be achieved by all the institutions ever created by man it is this democracy in practical it was this that the communists took cognizance of and figured on they did it three times between nineteen eighteen and nineteen forty two in each time in crisis when they thought the material values which they wished to substitute as the goal of struggle were enhanced by their very absence the terms they used were purely materialistic too and they applied them in a context that was unbounded by the american continent and this was another mistake the american communist negroes 
the communists said are the historical leaders of their comrades in africa and fit them for dealing the most telling blows to world imperialism as allies of the world's working class is enough to justify all the time and energy that the workers communist party must devote to the mobilization for the revolutionary struggle of the negro workers in american industry then they tried to extirpate the spiritual values of democracy by extirpating christianity they did not carry on a full-scale campaign of godlessness among american negroes but the negro poet langston hughes who went to visit russia as a guest of the state came back apparently spiritually callous and published the poem goodbye christ and the appalling fact was lost on no one by and large negroes did not feel that christ and religion were ready for the discard certainly not before they had been tried indeed their egalitarian aspirations had their roots in biblical injunction so the purge of the priests the smashing of icons and the tearing down of the churches which negroes read about in the american press were factors in the failure of the communist party to win the support of the black masses and to this one other matter and the whole story though oversimplified of that of failure is told ad patriotism in some sophisticated negro circles it is a matter for amused laughter that no negro has ever been a traitor to the united states but the laughter does not abrogate the fact more perhaps than any other american minorities negroes have had inducements to treachery clark expressed it what has this country ever done for me and of course negroes before and since have asked the same question it is purely rhetorical clark did not realize it but america its ideals its direction its basic spirit for we must again deal with abstractions had given him a belief in the individual worth and the dignity of himself as a man du bois i think was right when back in his young good days he said first this is our country we have worked for it we have suffered for it we have fought for it we have reached in this land our highest modern development and nothing humanly speaking can prevent us from eventually reaching here the full stature of our manhood our wrongs are still wrong but we will not bargain with our loyalty i am just cynical enough to add a sour note this loyalty comes in part from a fear of expulsion it is a historic fear stemming back to the colonialization movement in the seventeenth century recently negroes have seen another minority in other countries expelled and they know it can be done but american negroes have no palestine i will not say that negroes saw democracy as the highest final product of man's political development nor that they saw enough differences between communism and democracy to reassure them of the worth of the latter they did not come to that stage of intellection and neither did i until much later i do not think that even the negro communists so recently in the news with all their reputation for mental acumen have thought much about the real differences for actually of course the communist doctrine like the dogma of the most fundamental religious sect does not encourage thought if it did there probably would be less than a village full of communists in the whole western world for it would be seen that communism is a falling away from the idea that the western world has lived by since the middle ages the idea that man is the end of all human endeavor and that mere survival and security are not enough for man and this distinction is only gross enough to explain why communism is the ideology of crisis why it must seize its chance to win men's minds when their highest hope is only to stave off death no even the intellectuals seem not to have seen this and the other distinctions are subtler finer but they are also fundamental first of all communism is revolution a rupture of order a break in the evolution of western civilization democracy on the other hand is a way of conducting affairs so that there is some kind of harmonious continuity in the direction of society there may be errors and blunders and there are certainly lags but the people in a democracy are themselves so sensitive that they automatically exert a corrective force in the way a ship's gyroscope does 
this sensitiveness is the strength of democracy communism must operate within a relatively simple but rigid structure like the class of society with a narrow philosophic base and narrowly defined aims so that the prestige of authority can be enhanced to tyrannical proportions and so that the decrees of authority can be immediately and continuously checked there is no margin either for error or disagreement democracy is a complex way of life lacking the utter concentration of energy in any one direction save in time of national emergency that marks communism and that makes no allowance for opposing points of view communism must drastically curtail men's freedom in the first place prescribe his rights and privileges in the second and finally it must stand constantly ready to alienate those rights by force if necessary or by the show of force or by the implication of force democracy seeks a constant enlargement of man's freedom because in modern times communism has seemed able to establish itself only by violence it seems reasonable to assume that violence is necessary to its perpetuation while at the same time it is more susceptible to disintegration through violence under communism man is the slave of the state under democracy the state is the servant of man if all this editorializing sounds somewhat beside the point since only peripherally does it have to do with my negroness then i can only plead that it seems to me a description of the sober facts and that it is by way of being an explanation to the communist of my anti-communism i should have given it to them ten years ago they should have had it back in nineteen forty two when after a ten-year layoff the communists came at me again and made it necessary for me to try to achieve a certain degree of clarity about these issues i had written a book called no day of triumph and the communists saw advanced copies of it they liked it though i am still puzzled why perhaps it was because i did not actually condemn communism but as a matter of fact expressed sympathy for one mike chowan who had long been a communist and who had fought with the lincoln battalion in spain whatever the reason new masses first published an excerpt from my book without as i remember getting either my permission or that of the publisher soon after the new masses excerpt appeared and several weeks before publication i began to get letters from communists all over the country some of these came from bookstore managers who told me that they were going to push the book and who invited me to tease and hold autograph parties i accepted only one of these invitations to speak to a group in washington where i had to go on other business anyway later i was asked to appear on a radio program with ella winters in philadelphia but a previous commitment interfered a little while after publication i went to new york to attend a dinner party for carl van vechten when that was over some time after midnight without quite realizing what we were in for my wife and i accepted an invitation to another gathering and found ourselves in an apartment on west fifty-sixth street surrounded by a motley crowd who told me that they were going to make no day of triumph a bestseller they were going to put me as a writer they said in the same income class with howard fast and richard wright who they claimed but for them would not have been where they were toward dawn what seemed to be a committee of three cornered me in the kitchenette and asked me whether i would sign a card i said i would have to think about it what i have written above is what i thought End of section ten. Section eleven of Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section eleven. So far as I know, no one from the outside has ever tried to infect the Negro group with fascism. There have been some inside the group, but excepting Marcus Garvey, I do not think they were consciously fascist. Negro colleges have tended to breed fascism. I would say a mild form of it except that fascism is organically hysterical and there is no mild form of it and i have met negro college presidents whose notions are so provocative of suspicious wonder and who by the way they run their institutions 
seem to be convinced that the methods of democracy are weak and decadent themselves generally victims of a tyranny imposed from without they are tyrants within the academic group and if given a chance outside it too they play the strong man and the dictator role they think that people and things should be lined up by the superior intellects with which they feel their positions endow them they have a vast contempt for faculty members whom they regard as justly underprivileged employees perhaps of somewhat more value than janitors but of considerably less value than football coaches more dangerously this presidential contempt engulfs students who grow into maturity with personalities habituated to submission and who are likely to believe in the infallibility of the dictatorship principle in general negro educated negroes have never learned to live with freedom and this is why they are almost totally missing from the ranks of those who apply the privileges and the tools of democracy to the construction of freedom's spacious house where they have taken over as leaders of negro communities there arises a nauseating reek of devious and oily obsequiousness it is a kind of fascism in reverse a group of negro parents in a virginia city wish to equalize the facilities of the negro school with those of white schools one of the things that the colored school lacked was a cafeteria this was particularly noticeable because the city school board had just added such a convenience at a cost of twenty thousand dollars to the only white school without it the negro parents went to the principal of their own school as an ambitious and hard-working educator less complacent and time-serving than most of his type he had ideas and the chief one was that the parents group solicit funds he thought two thousand five hundred dollars would do it in negro homes churches and other racial institutions by a show of initiative and energy he thought it might be brought home to the white people that negro citizens were worthy of consideration naturally among those to whom the project was first presented was the negro acknowledged as the colored community's leader a lawyer graduate of a negro college and a white law school the esteem he commanded among his own people and the attention he could get from the whites were very real a friend of mine happened to be in the lawyer's office when the committee of parents went there whether out of boorishness as my friend thinks or because of the very human desire to prove his influence or because he clearly saw his duty as a leader the lawyer took over completely we'll get in touch with some real money he said no point in piddling around with the colored folks two cents worth then picking up the telephone he called several of his white friends a peanut produce manufacturer he carefully identified them between calls a banker and an insurance broker among others and explained to them the negro parents project for the school in ten minutes of the most consummate fawning my friend said afterward the lawyer had solicited pledges of more than a thousand dollars he typed out an identifying statement for the parents and sent them off to collect from his white friends my friend said she watched open-mouthed during this masterly performance it was like being at the theatre when you're so struck by the skill of the star that you don't think of the play itself until after the curtain falls or maybe it isn't skill that strikes you maybe it's personality i remember catherine cornell in well it was exactly like that my friend said with something very like awe in her voice and in her pale face she recovered after the curtain had fallen mr so-and-so she asked do you mean to tell me you're begging white people in this community to give you things that everybody ought to have and that you have as much right to as they this is nineteen fifty one haven't you heard what's going on the legal suits for equalization and all oh the lawyer said laughing blandly they don't want to sue they just want a cafeteria like the white schools have thurgood marshall chief legal counsel of the national association for the advancement of colored people has said that the hardest job his staff has had in bringing equal education suits has been to persuade negro teachers and representative negro parents to stand as plaintiffs they have to be bludgeoned out of their childish faith in the short-term profits of their minority middle-class position 
they have to be taught with pain and patience that democracy is a legitimate enterprise that its institutions must make for their dignity and that they cannot save themselves without forgetting themselves in the struggle to save the rights of man negro colleges are doing almost none of this teaching what i am trying to make clear is the actual condition of the average middle-class american negro mind halfway through the twentieth century to explain how this condition came about would involve a good deal of history besides i have already tried to explain it in another place the only point is that the condition does exist and it is not healthy nor can it be cured it seems to me by the superficial therapy of integration on special levels the graduate and professional school level for instance which is now being hailed as a cure-all it is not integration on this level is at best a victory for the method of democracy and method and spirit are not necessarily one for years upper middle class american negroes have been going to graduate and professional schools with whites without learning and without stimulating by their presence there the inclusive kind of thinking that is necessary to the fulfillment of the spirit of democracy associations on such levels are as casual and random as the flow of unchanneled water they do not bite deep into idea patterns nor thrust themselves down into the matrix of emotion integration must start at much lower levels in kindergarten and sunday school in cub scouts and campfire girls before idea patterns are fixed and before the matrix of emotion is stuffed with the corruption of intolerance integration must be complete and absolutely without ifs ands and buts eventually of course from these levels it would proceed to intermarriage but what harm then it is not entirely facetious to say that legal intermarriage would only sanction and somewhat equalize the miscegenation that has been going on in this country since sixteen twenty two when it is said the first child of mixed negro white parentage was born in america and to say that intermarriage between american negroes and whites would increase the vitality of the american people is biologically sound fortunately integration is not a political concept though it has been made a political issue and is therefore not identified with the name of a leader this has the advantage of depriving the opposition of that damaging leverage of vulnerable personality which leadership identification always provides and which can destroy or throw into long-lasting paralysis even the most salutary and easily defended social concepts if you cannot overthrow the ideas which you fear or hate then attack the man behind the ideas and thus debase what he stands for that is the history of the struggle against ideas but if the concept of integration has this advantage it also has the disadvantage of being indivisible there is no decalogue of integration each item of which can be separately assimilated and practiced it is not a one thing at a time thing nor a first things first thing it must be assimilated all at once or killed all at once and it is this fact i think that frightens negroes of the more stable classes they see in integration a breakdown of certain monopolies in education and the professions and some business enterprises in my own home town for instance where segregation could have been abolished twenty years ago the negro owner of the only negro theatre who was at the same time on the city council fought every attempt to wipe out the practice of excluding negroes from white theatres indoor sporting events and other places of entertainment he could get aid and comfort from a negro school principal and certain negro teachers who were afraid that the l would lead to the mile and that their jobs would be thrown into an open non-racial competition which they were not prepared they felt to meet but also integration is in conflict with all that whites as well as negroes have been taught to believe it is in conflict with all that they think of as making for harmonious social development most whites are convinced that integration is the way to social and even biological disaster conviction is emotional and generally not to be argued with if segregationalists could be argued with they would not be segregationalists in the first place they have taken that position on non-arguable grounds and i think they have taken it quite contrary to their intellectual understanding of the problem
central to our age the georgia legislature in this year nineteen fifty one was very sincere when it saw fit to pass a bill providing that no funds appropriated for education could go to institutions that did not enforce segregation only weeks later governor burns of south carolina who has been a senator a supreme court justice and secretary of state declared that the politicians in washington and the negro agitators in north carolina who today seek to abolish segregation in all schools will learn that what a carpetbag government could not do in the reconstruction period cannot be done in this period he then proceeded to express the view that before what could not be done would be done the public school system in south carolina would be abolished this is paradox and irony there is the obvious irony of advocating the abolishment of the very thing on which democracy must rest a publicly schooled citizenry in order to ensure as burns implied the perpetuation of democracy but the paradox goes deeper for if there is emotionalism in burns words there is also the opposite of emotionalism for his words represent a deliberate and a socially dominant response based on static concepts and ideals the concept of the negro's inherent inferiority and the ideal of the white anglo-saxon predominantly protestant community which earns its right to divine favor because it contributes to negro causes does not deliberately encourage the persecution of either jews or catholics and even occasionally permits itself the hazard of proclaiming the world one that the concept of complete integration which seems to me to represent the logical evolution of democratic thinking should be in deep conflict with the actualities of american learning i will not say teaching is the supreme paradox of our democracy the central problem of our age is that of expressing the oneness of man the unesco statement on race makes this abundantly clear the unity of mankind from both the biological and social viewpoints is the main thing to recognize this and to act accordingly is the first requirement of modern man admittedly americans and a goodly portion of the peoples of the western world believe that democracy is the frame and perhaps the only frame within which unity can be achieved and maintained they must believe this else their propagandic and materialistic promotion of it their assiduous and even frantic efforts to sell it to the rest of the world is basically an immoral and selfish offering of the democratic experience to mankind at the price of man's soul in so far as the american people who lead the western world believe that democracy is the enduring frame of unity then they must flatter themselves with a belief in a great destiny and this is all very well but they must also realize that western democratic civilization has arrived at the point at which the path of development proper to man and necessary to democracy is marked integration if it is not chosen now then the american people must reform their wants modify detrusively their ideals and deliberately dissolve those organic bonds of principle which give the ultimate meaning to democracy they must stop being moved by the symbols the unalienable rights of man the pursuit of happiness liberty and equality and enshrine instead of these symbols of man's hope those of fear survival collective security the journey down the path of integration is not one to be put off until tomorrow tomorrow is now i do not wish to push this too far but there can be little doubt that integration is a practical concern latent in our modern world it is no preposterous idealism offered merely in contravention of a prevailing view and practices that are working for most men the simple truth is that the prevailing practices are not working for most men while at the same time his conscience is disturbed by this fact western man is so fixed in the once comfortable conviction of his own superiority that he seems powerless to change the practices that support his conviction this is a fault of his adolescence it is a cavalier unconcern for his lack of knowledge of others it is an inability to understand the world society of which he is a part 
world society is no longer a metaphysical abstraction it is very real very concrete it is real enough to have reduced the margin for national initiative in the conduct of internal affairs it is no longer possible for the united states to keep the differences she has made between the races and embedded in law and custom without making a fundamental denial of what she professes before the world to stand for and to fight for the entity of mankind end of section eleven section twelve of on being negro in america by j saunders redding this librivox recording is in the public domain section twelve perhaps i make too much of this and perhaps i am overwrought and unreasonable about it i must confess that there flit across my mind like stones skipped on the surface of water only to sink into it thoughts of my sons there are moments when i am sentimental enough to hope that history is a necessary progress toward better things and that frustrations of the human spirit grow less and less i know better but i have such hopes when my sons are involved and i am inclined to support them intemperately it does not serve merely to shrug one's shoulders and carp about the psychic traumas that bedevil american man at least it did not do seven years ago when my older son was eight and my younger not yet born and now that my younger is himself almost seven it still will not do argument does not exactly serve either although i think i argue for something eminently sane it is simplicity i argue the substitution of spontaneous instinctive responses for the deliberate responses based as i have said above on unchanging ideas and ideals it seems to me that the old rules evoked as they were out of the utmost confusion of morality and social expedience and deliberate ignorance are not only unnecessarily complicated for modern times and people but they are progressively unsuitable to modern ways of thinking to the advance of knowledge to technology and surely everyone will allow this to one worldness make the rules simple enough and we can play the hardest game what happened to my older son and also to my younger son just recently though not in circumstances so distressing nor in details so graphic was that while he was playing the game with all the exuberance of an eight-year-old somebody complicated up the rules i remember distinctly how it happened for several weeks while my wife was with child it was my unaccustomed duty to make the marketing as it is so quaintly put in the upper south our market was a co-op on the highway just outside town in the heart of one of those neat and monotonous residential communities that seemed to spring up everywhere in the nineteen forties my wife loved the place it was convenient its stock was excellent and its prices generally somewhat lower than in the chain groceries besides it had a negro a colleague and friend on its board of directors and as a second novel attraction it employed several negroes at least one as clerk and another as butcher the co-op's atmosphere unlike that of the chains was friendly warm leisurely my wife supposed it was because of the neighborhood a better than average middle-class neighborhood segregated of course of aircraft designers engineers and other technological experts and a scattering of armed service personnel no one lower than a lieutenant in the navy or a captain in the army it seemed from the various military installations close by as one of the charter stockholders i was determined to love the place too friday was market day until her condition prevented her going my wife's eager companion on these expeditions was our son sometime in the spring he had struck up a friendship at the co-op and he anticipated its weekly renewal with pleasurable excitement the first time i took him there i saw the revival of the fraternity with quickened heart my son burst through the door ahead of me stopped looked down the first aisle fresh fruits and vegetables ran to the second and looked and then suddenly let out an indian whoop reggie and got one for an answer conway and then i saw a handsome dark-haired dark-eyed boy of about conway's age break from the side of a young negro girl and come bursting up the aisle between the high stacked shelves of brightly packaged foods toward my son 
they stood looking at each other for a moment then they came together each with an arm around the shoulder of the other and exploded off to play outside among the cars until market was made i looked at the uniformed negro girl and she smiled and i smiled and that was that it was that way for four or five weeks conway and reggie met each other with what seemed the force of projectiles and went skyrocketing off leaving the market i would find them outside hot and happy playing at some impossible game then one friday reggie we never learned his last name was not there with a negro maid his guardian this time was a man a tall handsome person about forty i judged who in spite of the phi beta kappa key slung across his flat stomach looked outdoorsy and virile the boys came together as usual and went outside as usual but the man's marketing must have been nearly done for before i could finish picking out the heaviest juiciest oranges conway was back with me again where's reggie i asked him he had to go he said his daddy was in a hurry but already he was looking forward to the next week the uniform maid was with reggie again the next week but this time when conway let out his customary whoop there was no vocal answer reggie turned it seemed to me with momentary eagerness but there was no yell and rush he approached very slowly he was smiling weakly but that smile died as he came perhaps sensing that something was wrong conway himself now hesitated what's the matter he asked reggie come on man let's go don't you want to play i can't play with you reggie said what's the matter are you sick conway wanted to know i just can't play with you any more reggie said conway moved a fraction closer to me clutched the handle of the food cart i was pushing the maid stood at some distance pretending not to watch the pleasant-voiced pleasant-faced shoppers of the neighborhood flowed around us other children younger skittered and yelled up and down the aisles the compacted odors of fresh pastry of ground coffee of fruits and vegetables and the colors of all these were as ever but a chill was beginning to form around my heart before conway asked the next question i knew the answer that was coming i did not know the words of it but i knew the feel the iron that he would not be prepared for the corrosive rust that it would make in his blood and that unless i was skillful as my father was not i could never draw off at that moment no before the moment of the answer i wanted to pick conway up and hold him hard against me and ward off the demoralizing blow that might be struck for a lifetime but i could not forfend if even by grasping my son by the hand and walking off in another direction i was transfixed why reggie scowled then a grimace that was not really ugly yet because it was associated only with words and not with feeling that would come later and the word would be made flesh and the flesh would be his forever now the scowl was only imitation because you're a nigger that's why reggie said conway looked at me wonderingly not feeling hurt as they say a man knowing himself shot but still without pain will look with surprise i'm better than you reggie said cause my father said so you are not conway said but i thought he shrank a little against me no son he isn't i said i am so too reggie said looking at both of us words were beginning to arouse emotion and link with emotion the sneer was no longer imitation he stood bearing his weight on his left foot his hands in the pockets of his khaki shorts the whiteness of him showing in a streak just below the hairline the rest of him bare trunk bare legs tanned almost to the color of my son no son i said as much to the one as to the other i think i felt sorry for reggie too i do now at any rate thinking back you are not conway said and straightened my daddy says you aren't you don't go to my school you don't go to my church you don't go to the movies i go to i bet you never even seen tim holt he put in parenthetically and that's because you're not good enough yah yah reggie said niggers work for us niggers work for us you're a nigger and trixie's a nigger and trixie works for us it was a shrilling sing-song yah yah nigger nigger go peddle your papers nigger with this he ran off back i suppose to trixie who worked for him because she was a nigger 
conway did not cry but in his eyes was the look of a wound and i knew how it could grow become infected and pump its poison to every tissue to every brain cell he stayed close to me while i made market on the way home he said savagely i hate this car it did not seem like any kind of entree to what i knew i must talk about and the sooner the better when what happened to him happens it makes a nasty wound which demands immediate attention you want a knife to do the job quickly deftly cleanly but the only instruments in the surgery kit are words so when i wanted to know what was wrong with the car and why he hated it and he said why can't we have a good car a new car with a radio and a bigger one like reggie's i tried to explain to him that it was war time that cars were scarce and prices high and that in order to get a new car you had to do something a little underhanded something that was not much different from stealing or cheating did reggie's father steal i wouldn't say that i said but i wouldn't put it past him he's not a good man how do you know you don't know him do you no i said but i don't have to know him to know he's not a good man i put it as simply as i could i told him that parents are frequently reflected in their children i made him laugh a little by reminding him of the time when he was six he had acutely embarrassed his mother and me by telling one of our friends i think you have store-bought teeth which was exactly what he had heard me say about the friend those things reggie said today his father said to him that's how i know reggie's father is not a good man he wasn't telling the truth was he no i said shaking my head i mean about him being better no i answered then why can't i go to his school and to his movies this was the deeper infection and i did not know how to deal with it words were poultices to seal the infection in i could recall them from my own childhood in answer to a why for children are not born with answers words spoken by my parents my teachers my friends words could seal in the infection and seal in also the self that might never break through again except with extreme luck but i had no choice save to use them i told him about prejudice no one has ever made the anatomy of prejudice simple enough for children and the reason you don't go to reggie's school i remember saying is because there are people like reggie's father it's all complicated up conway answered it was a relief to laugh at his child's expression but i noticed he was not laughing and at home some minutes later when i finished storing the groceries in the pantry i found him pressed against his mother's rounded bosom crying without restraint but even that did not end it he cried it all out his mother said she was wrong seven years afterward in the late spring of nineteen fifty we had a letter from the headmaster of conway's new england preparatory school we have been unable to reach him he seems to prefer to be alone and will not participate even in those activities for which he has undoubted talents naturally this attitude has given us serious concern for an important part of our educational program is training in citizenship and cooperative living perhaps there is only a slight connection but i would be hard to convince end of section twelve section thirteen of on being negro in america by j saunders redding this librivox recording is in the public domain section thirteen i am well aware that there is supposed to be something reprehensible in advocating marriage between races enough were i a faculty member in a public supported college in the south to bring about my dismissal for advocacy of it in some metaphysical corner of the white man's mind intermarriage is identified with immorality biological peculiarity and perversion this identification is partly a matter of conscience and as gunner Myrdal exhaustively explains partly a matter of jealousy the unrestricted use of the negro woman as sex-mate and mammy during slavery did a strange thing to the white man's mind it filled it with anxiety guilt and a grotesque exaggeration of the negro male's sexual equipment an equipment from which the white male has felt compelled to protect white womanhood ever since 
in Meredale's words, the necessity to protect the white female against this fancied prowess of the male negro is a fixed constellation in the ethos of America. The common belief runs that the white girl who marries a negro is morally depraved and certainly sexually abnormal, for no normal white girl could possibly enjoy the average negro's savage sexual potency. As for the white man who marries a negro woman, he will soon tire of her extraordinary sensuality and return to the safer, saner sex practices of his own kind. Such assertions made by the majority race with all the blatant insistence of an uneasy conscience have conditioned the negro sufficiently to prevent his speaking out in favor of intermarriage, but no one has bothered to validate the declarations of sexual incompatibility between the races with scientific investigations. No one, so far as I know, has made a study, for instance, of the comparative sexuality of the Negro American and the White American, that such incompatibility exists between normal individuals of the two races, is an emotion-based assumption which finds sanction and support in statutes prohibiting intermarriage. Such statutes seem to me to be the most fundamental expression of the human inequality to which the Negro is subjected. They strike at the deepest roots of personal dignity and self-respect. It is one thing, and a very good thing, to be acknowledged as a first-class citizen. It is another and a better thing to be acknowledged a first-class human being. This is the ultimate civility. But if the assumption of sexual incompatibility is based in emotion, the beliefs about miscegenation are founded on pure mythology. The myths about negro-white blood mixture are a curious interweaving of the biological, the moral, and the social. The myths are contradictory enough to be mutually exclusive, but emotionalism absorbs the contradictions. In the first place, quite contrary to all other blood group designations, in America, anyone having a single drop of Negro blood is classed as a Negro, inasmuch as this practice was thought to place a restraint on interracial concubinage, though during slavery its real purpose was to increase the number of human chattels, it once had a kind of left-handed moral sanction. Since that time, it has become a national habit and is solidified by law in the southern states. It has engendered beliefs as irrational and as inexplicable as nightmares. White men have won libel suits for mistakenly being called Negro, yet there is a strong belief among the majority of whites that for the Negro to have white blood is to adulterate his highest and best potentials. But the matter is even crazier than that, for another belief is simultaneously held only Negroes with white blood begin to approach the white man's biological, mental, and moral standards. At the same time that the Reverend Thomas Dixon, Jr., was setting forth in his best-selling novel, The Leopard Spots, and his smash hit drama, The Klansman, the proposition that the offspring of mixed parentage were degenerate, crafty, vicious, and depraved, the superior attainments of Booker T. Washington, were being accounted for by the fact that his father was white. The kind, gentle, loyal Negro mammies were always pure black, but all the colored tarts that ever lured white men to lethean beds were high yeller. The term half-white, forever loosely used, covers all degrees of blood mixture and all kinds of contrarieties. If there were rationality in the matter, then in keeping with the implication of the dominance of negro blood over white blood in the accepted definition of negro the term would be half black it makes no kind of sense that half white should mean an endowment of all the criminal tendencies and a prodigy like philippa schuyler whose mother is white and walter white who is more than a quarter white and the novelist frank yerby who is perhaps an eighth and ralph bunch who is a thirty-second it makes no kind of sense that an intelligent white woman, on first seeing Paul Robeson, whose reputation was international and then unsmirched, should remark to her companion, Why, I expected him to be black. I thought, you know, if they had white blood, they generally turned out badly. 
if that were the case at least ten million of the fourteen million american negroes would be bad ones and if all those who have a drop of negro blood confessed to it there would be uncountable numbers more for the fact is that many miscegenates pass over into the white race every day a conservative estimate is that four million negroes with all their spermatozoa and ova genes and chromosomes have been absorbed into the white american bloodstream in the last two decades they have left scarcely a trace negroes throw up a protective wall of silence around individual passing thus it is well known among colored people that a certain famous moving picture star is the daughter of a negro woman the white but not the negro public was shocked four or five years ago when a prominent new york lawyer made a courtroom confession of his tarbrush parentage in order to clear himself for a share in a rich bequest many white people eminent in public life in industry in government and the arts are known by negroes to be negro and if there were truth in the myths passing would be all but impossible the black blood would tell in real life as it is so frequently made to do in fiction industrialists and other employers would detect it in absenteeism gold bricking and general shiftlessness psychologists would spot it by behavior indexes unmodulated speech flashy clothes and other forms of exhibitionism physiologists would detect it in the shape and tincture of the fingernails and in the thickness of the skull anatomists would see it in the curious heel structure which was supposed to account for the speed of jesse owens ralph metcalf et al of the negro male and in the peculiar ovoid shape of the negro female's buttocks psychiatrists would mark it in overt aggressive tendencies or in other forms of emotional infantilism or in a total absence of emotional response and every one would detect in it the rusty acrid unbearable odor that negroes give off End of section 13. Section 14 of On Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Section 14. While I am in a petulant mood, let me say that I am race conscious enough to be shocked and irritated frequently by what even professed white friends do not know on both personal and historical level about negroes there is a glaring case in point during her husband's administration mrs eleanor roosevelt became acquainted with a black bosomy and intensely dynamic woman named mrs mary mcloyd bethune the negro woman was then deputy administrator of n y a and through her the president's wife a sincere and fearless woman got closely involved with the race problem the white south fretted over the spectacle of mrs roosevelt being shepherded through the intricate mazes of racial and interracial affairs it was alleged and the south as did negroes everywhere took it for truth that mrs bethune through mrs roosevelt had special rights to the president's ear she certainly seemed to have such rights to the ear of f d r s wife more than one photograph shows the two women in earnest conversation in what seemed to be intimate circumstances mrs bethune is very much alive she is frequently mentioned and pictured in the colored press she is ex-president of the national federation of colored women she took a dominant part in a conference on old age at the shoreham hotel in washington in nineteen fifty she spoke at perhaps a half dozen major college commencements in nineteen fifty one but in her book this i remember written in nineteen forty nine mrs roosevelt after words of heartening warmth for the black woman refers to her as the late dead deceased mrs mary mcloyd bethune mrs roosevelt's reputation earned at the cost of great personal criticism for knowledge about and interest in negroes for liberalism for social intelligence and tact is as a broad penstroke underscoring the pattern of false belief and cavalier know nothing about the negro attitude to which the majority conforms yet even she could make this error as an ideal of course i am all in for the deletion of racial designations in newspaper stories and the like 
but the ideal is nowhere near attainment it seems that it is still a general practice in newsrooms in a large part of the country to specify race when negroes are involved in crime and it is still usual to omit except from feature stories and special articles racial designation and news copy that would reflect credit on the colored people when ralph bunch stepped in as mediator of the jewish arab dispute the fact that he was an american negro first broke in the foreign press in spite of hundreds of front page news stories from competent war correspondents it is even now not generally known that the twenty fourth infantry which fought so hard and bought with its life it was almost totally destroyed the time general macarthur needed in the early fighting in korea was a negro outfit in the segregated united states army personally as matters stand i would settle for something less than the ideal seldom does one see the minority group designations italian greek jewish irish and the like attached to crime stories involving persons of these groups but neither it is replied do you see them attached to other stories true and this is all very well it is a matter of nomenclature negro names being what they generally are as indigenous to america as hot dog or as unmistakably anglo-saxon derived as gudger ralph bunch and charles drew william hasty and george dow's cannon might belong to any anglo-saxon protestant or catholic but no one of reading intelligence would mistake bernard baruch or sholem ash as of other than jewish heritage or fiorello la guardia and vincent impelitiere as of other than italian ancestry or george scorvas as other than greek or or roosevelt and vanderbilt as other than dutch or william cardinal o'connell as other than irish we make these associations automatically and there passes into the communal intelligence some sense of the contributions these groups make to american life on the other hand diffused throughout our national life and thought is the fallacy that the negro has contributed nothing substantial not to know the negro on the group and historical level is to rob him of his pride and of his rightful share in the american heritage he cannot claim what is his except in an entorted and psychologically unhealthy way the negro on the lower level saves himself from complete madness by following a pattern of neurotic expression that is patent in its lazy-lipped and mumbling speech in his gay bird dress and in his prow-like walk the negro on the upper level turns back upon himself with a voracity of egocentrism that bewilders the casual observer what a self-conscious people your negroes are a recent french visitor exclaimed he was right the negro lives constantly on two planes of awareness watching the telecast of a boxing match between ezar charles the negro who happened to be a heavyweight champion and a white challenger a friend of mine said i don't like charles as a person one level but i've got to root for him to beat this white boy and good second level one's heart is sickened at the realization of the primal energy that goes undeflected and unrefined into the sheer business of living as a negro in the united states in any one of the united states negroness is a kind of superconsciousness that directs thinking that dictates action and that perverts the expression of instinctual drives which are salutary and humanitarian the civic drive for instance so that in general negroes are cynically indifferent to politics the societal drive so that ordinarily the negro's concerned is only with himself as an individual and even the sex and love drive so that many negroes suffer sexual maladjustments and many a negro couple refuse to bear children who will inevitably grow up under a burden of obloquy and shame that would daunt and degrade a race of angels it is impossible to believe with lillian smith that the psychological damage caused by the race situation in america is greater to whites than to negroes every one of us knows an internationally known negro said recently that there is no normal american negro public asylums for the mentally deranged offer a telling statistic though negroes are something less than ten per cent of the country's population they are eleven per cent of the total population of public institutions for the insane compulsively disassociated from the american tradition 
the negro on the upper level has had to maintain the pretense of possessing what he is in fact denied he has had no choice but this he has not been free to realize his ideals or to strive to be what the american tradition has made him wish to be paul lawrence dunbar probably the most popular american poet at the turn of the century did not wish to write jingles in a broken tongue but he was negro and as a negro he had to write dialect or else have no hearing as a poet james weldon johnson did not wish to compose those darky lyrics and coon songs for williams and walker's and his own brother rosamond's show nor did williams and walker and rosamond johnson wish to sing them and caper to them but how else were they to find outlets for their creative urges when all of the more congenial and less particularized were dammed up against them du bois had ideas for a career other than the one he was compelled to follow had it not been for the race problem early thrust upon me and enveloping me he wrote in dusk of dawn i should have probably been an unquestioning worshipper at the shrine of social order and economic development into which i was born what was wrong was that i and people like me and thousands of others who might have my ability and aspiration were refused permission to be a part of the world it was as though moving on a rushing express my main thought was as to the relations i had to other passengers on the express and not to its rate of speed and its destination my attention from the first was focused upon the problem of the admission of my people into the freedom of democracy the disassociation of the negro from the american tradition and the lack of knowledge of the negro on the historical level are certainly in part the fault of social commentators and historians and social scholars the historians particularly have been guilty of almost complete silence like william a dunning or of faulty investigation like james ford rhodes or of misinterpretation of the facts like ulrich phillips and w e woodward or of propaganda like william e dodd and jesse carpenter or of frank and determined anti-negro bias like dozens major and minor including claude bowers james truslow adams and john w burgess the last of whom by his prestige as a faculty member at columbia university gave scholarly sanction to prejudice he wrote as follows the claim that there is nothing in the color of the skin from the point of view of political ethics is a great sophism a black skin means membership in a race of men which has never of itself succeeded in subjecting passion to reason has never therefore created any civilization of any kind to put such a race of men in possession of a state government in a system of federal government is to trust them with the development of political and legal civilization upon the most important subjects of human life there is something natural in the subordination of an inferior race to a superior race even to the point of the enslavement of the inferior race it is the white man's mission his duty and his right to hold the reins of political power in his own hands for the civilization of the world and the welfare of mankind ignorance and willful distortion of the facts of american life and history in regard to the negro's role have set the negro scholar what up to now has been a thankless task in pure self-defense he has had to try to set the record straight the first negro professional writer in america william wells brown was primarily a historian negro scholars have written thousands of dissertations theses monographs articles essays and books in a gigantic effort to correct the multiple injuries done the race by white writers five great collections at howard hampton fisk yale and the harlem branch of the new york public library house thousands of volumes and hundreds of magazine and newspaper files but few except negroes bother to disturb their dust whites show little interest in this negro anna they seem to feel that they do not need to know about the negro they seem to feel that the basic truths about him were established long ago even the primary source material on him whom white america calls the greatest negro american him who they have enshrined in the hall of fame and about whom they have written ten million words even the primary source material on booker washington some twenty thousand letters and other papers remains scarcely touched and certainly unexplored in the library of congress 
though the harvard university press published an erudite and definitive biography of the man in nineteen forty nine negro writers remain generally unrepresented in anthologies of american literature though in the light of the cultural history of america the slave biographies and there are some literary ones among them are at least as important as anything saber smith charles augustus davis john p kennedy and william gilmore sims ever wrote paul lawrence dunbar was a better poet and in the opinion of william dean howells a more popular poet and by the very standard of indigenousness which some anthologists claim to follow a more important poet than james whitcomb riley james weldon johnson and claude mckay enjoyed international reputations as writers but they are absent from the best-known american anthologies richard wright has been translated into a dozen languages including the chinese and is rated by europeans with steinbeck hemingway and faulkner but american anthologies neglect him gwendolyn brooks has won the pulitzer prize for poetry which is more than jesse stewart and william carlos williams have done but her work is not in the collections of american writing nor is the most representative work by whites who have written about negroes with some regard for justice and truth editors use faulkner's arose for emily the bear and chapters from sir Taurus and told by an idiot but not evening sun go down or excerpts from light in august and intruder in the dust chapters from huckleberry finn are used but not those which show nigger jim to be much like other human beings nor those which excoriate the institution of slavery and express huck's hatred of it george w cable is generally represented by selections from old creole days and innocuous passages from the grandissimes but never by madame dolphine certainly one of his best books the silent south or the negro question the result of this arrogant neglect has been to render american cultural history less effective as an instrument of diagnosis and evaluation what we have as history reflects little credit upon american historians as scholars their work makes pleasant reading and inflates the national ego but it does not tell those sometimes hard and shameful truths that might now be helpful for the world to know what lillian smith calls the old conspiracy of silence needs to be broken and the maze of fantasy and falsehood that has little resemblance to the actual world needs to be dissolved the psychopathic resistance to self-knowledge that the american mind has developed must be broken down what we have got to know are the things that actually happen and are still happening in america with these things clear before us Perhaps we can use our knowledge and experience for the guidance of mankind. End of section 14. Section 15 of On Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 15. But there are limits to what even knowledge can accomplish as any psychologist will tell you knowledge alone is not enough to redeem life from folly and to save men from despair if it ever was it is no longer valid to assume that learning supreme glory is in the safeguarding of humanity the dispelling of prejudice and the achieving of those moral values that are said to have inspired men of other ages perhaps i am deeply pessimistic but i simply cannot believe that if only people knew enough of the what the why and the how all would be right with the world knowledge does not ensure moral behavior it all too willingly puts itself at the surface of despotism and inhumanity i suppose that what is lacking in our modern learning and among our modern learned is a sense that morality is the product of human experience that it comes anciently out of wisdom we have forgotten from a realization of the character of human life certainly the moralistic approach to human relations in general and to race relations in particular in america has failed so consistently that one mentions this approach with embarrassment and reluctance it is considered namby-pamby pusillanimous uncle tomish few even of the ministers of the gospel appeal to nobility and virtue and goodness any more 
except as those qualities seem disingenuously to be connected with practical concerns we no longer think of great men as being great in those virtuous qualities to which former and simpler ages subscribed those moral excellencies love honor truth seem to many ordinary people a long way removed from our normal affairs great men to-day are practical-minded realistic and public-spirited and none of these attributes i take it is necessarily virtuous to be trite about it any one of them can cover a multitude of evils the realistic attitude has been the excuse for innumerable travesties of human rights in the name of public spirit heinous crimes have been committed against the dignity of man and too many politicians and diplomats have made practical mindedness the inviolable sanction for the suppression of the worthy ambitions of the powerless it must be for instance the operation of these qualities that is leading to the continuing farce that american men are making of unesco's universal declaration of human rights they are making a farce of both its purpose and its content everyone knows or certainly everyone should know what the universal declaration of human rights is it is a document so clearly and simply expressive of what is in the hearts and minds of the men of the masses that indeed a man of the masses might easily have written it in nineteen forty six the representatives of eighteen national governments members of the united nations began work on the framing of a statement that would as mrs eleanor roosevelt said establish standards for human rights and freedom the world over so that the recognition of these rights and freedoms might become one of the cornerstones on which peace could eventually be based two years later the commission on human rights presented its declaration to the general assembly of the united nations forty-eight governments voted to accept it what they voted to accept is stated in the preamble whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom justice and peace in the world whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people whereas the peoples of the united nations have in the charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights in the dignity and worth of the human person and in the equal rights of men and women and have determined to promote social progress and better standards of life and larger freedom this was fine and hopeful and indeed the more so that the declaration was born of the charter of the united nations the charter is no blueprint for an abstract world it sets a premium on maturity of course but also it sets a premium on respect for reality after the general assembly's acceptance to make the universal declaration law there remained only the act of ratification by each participating government it was at this point that a hitch developed perhaps the state department had dismissed even at its inception the work of the commission on human rights as unimportant perhaps the state department was so concerned with the practical and immediate problems of the cold war that it simply forgot the declaration for two years and forgot too that the united states had taken the lead in securing the general assembly's adoption of a resolution embodying the declaration perhaps there were petty and selfish political considerations perhaps there was bald hypocrisy in the whole thing i cannot give cause i can only declare that when in nineteen fifty after what seemed an unnecessarily long delay the matter of ratification by the united states came up the state department demurred at first it demurred over the inclusion of articles twenty two through twenty seven of the declaration but since most of these articles embody principles which are already written into the united states law or supported by immemorial custom the state department's objection to them seemed inexplicable as rayford logan a member of the united states national commission for unesco pointed out at the time 
there is nothing revolutionary to american principles in the statement that everyone has a right to social security or in the statement that everyone has a right to education or in the statement that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health no the objection seemed to be to article twenty three one everyone has the right to work to free choice of employment to just and favorable conditions of work and to protection against unemployment two everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work once the declaration was ratified these clauses would have necessitated the establishment of a law no different in intent from the proposed f e p c but that is not the point that mr edward w barrett of the state department made in stating the objection to acceptance of the entire declaration whereas he wrote a maximum degree of agreement exists outside the iron curtain on political and civil rights there is no general agreement on economic and social rights the laws and practices of the members of the united nations differ widely on those rights as set forth in the declaration it does not particularly matter i suppose that this amounts to saying that the united nations had not agreed on what they obviously had agreed on nor that no clear and sharp distinction such as mr barrett's letter implies can be drawn between political and civil rights on the one hand and economic and social rights on the other it does not particularly matter because the state department gave even grosser expression to the realistic point of view that to paraphrase democracy is based on compromises in which big ends are surrendered to small goals article sixteen of the universal declaration of human rights says one men and women of full age without any limitation due to race nationality or religion have the right to marry and to found a family could it be that this provision was in mr barrett's mind when he wrote neither the executive branch nor the congress would desire that our government should ratify a convention which contains obligations that our government and our people are unwilling or unable to honor there is a deep sickness in the american mind and spirit and it threatens to infect democracy itself and render it impotent as an ideal but not only this the sickness also threatens to make democracy ineffective as an instrument through which the individual can realize his highest self and in cooperation with other selves give zest richness and meaning to human endeavor for democracy is two things it is a political instrument it is an ideal as an ideal the notion of the world as a vast arena where purposeless and inexplicable forces play and where inevitable fate renders the mind and the spirit of the individual helpless dissolves before it as an ideal it is in raw conflict with sterile determinism and fatalism it assumes that the only source of human happiness or misery is human beings themselves and its very dogma proclaims that cooperative endeavor is the way to human happiness and this is sensible for we know and we know it scientifically that cooperation is the law of life when men cooperate they and their enterprises prosper peace reigns this is not humanistic nonsense authorized to speak the considered opinion of a group of renowned scientific scholars of the committee of experts on race problems of unesco ashley montague declared man's inherent drives toward cooperation need but to be cultivated and intelligently handled for this world to be turned into a paradise on earth when all men will at last live by the rule it is their nature to live by the golden rule to love your neighbor as yourself end of section fifteen section sixteen of on being negro in america by j saunders redding this LibriVox recording is in the public domain section sixteen although i am not a very religious person i do not see how i can leave god out of consideration in these matters god has made to play a very conspicuous part 
in race relations in america at one time or another and often at the same time he has been the protagonist for both sides he has damned and blessed first one side and then the other with truly godlike impartiality his ultimate intentions revealed to inspired sages are preserved in a thousand volumes anyone who reads the literature of race cannot but be struck by the immoderate frequency with which god is invoked and by the painstaking consideration that is given even by social scientists to race relations as a problem of christian ethics god of course is an implicit assumption in the thought of our age he is one of those beliefs so spontaneous and ineluctable and taken so much as a matter of course that they operate with great effectiveness though generally on a level of subconsciousness in our society he is a belief that operates just by being like a boulder met in the path which must be dealt with before one can proceed on his journey god is a complex composed entirely of simple elements mediator father judge jury executioner and also love virtue charity each of which generates a very motley collection of often contradictory ideas god is a catalyst and he is also a formulated doctrine inertly symbolized in the ritual and the dogma of churches called christian god is the absolute reality but this does not prevent his being ostentatiously offered as the excuse for our society's failure to come to grips with big but relative realities god and the christian religion must be reckoned with i do not know how long i have held both god and the christian religion in some doubt though it must have been since my teens nor do i know exactly how this came about my father was and is very religious of great and clear and unbending faith my mother was less so but the family went regularly to church where we were all active and i used occasionally to see my mother so deeply touched by a religious feeling that she could not keep back the tears what inspired it in that chill atmosphere it is impossible to say i can only think that it came as a result of some very personal communion with god established perhaps by a random thought a word or a certain slant of light through the yellow and rose and purple windows there was never any shouting or getting happy among us or in our church none of that ecstatic abandon that set men and women jumping and dancing and screaming in the aisles after the northward migration following the first world war a few people who may have had a natural tendency to such transports found their way to our church but they were frustrated by the mechanical expertness of the uninspired sermons the formalized prayers and by the choir master's preference for hymns translated from fifteenth century latin never did i hear a spiritual sung in our church and only rarely a common meter calvinist hymn sometime during my teens i became aware that for most negroes god was a great deal more than a spirit to be worshipped on sundays he had a terrifying immediacy as material provider and protector once a group of us teenagers went on a sunday evening our own church worshipped only in the morning to a mission church deep in the bridge district where the negro population was concentrated we went to mock as some of us had heard our parents do at the malapropisms of the illiterate minister and his ignorant flock the crazy singing and shouting and the uninhibited behavior of members in religious ecstasy we did not remain to pray but i was struck by what i saw and heard and afterward my natural curiosity led me to go occasionally alone the service did not resemble either in ritual or content both of which were created spontaneously the service to which i was used any member of the church could stand up and pray a whole evening might be given over to these impulsive outbursts the prayers impressed me with their concreteness their concern for the every day i heard one distraught mother whose daughter evidently was sitting beside her beseech god now here's itabel and she's gone and got herself big and i'm asking you god to make the young rascal who done it marry her his name's herbie washington and he stays on the street next to me they prayed for bread not in a general symbolic give us this day our daily bread sense 
but for specific bread and meat for specific occasions aunt Callie black's layin' up there sick lord and when i seen her she told me her mouth was watering for some hot biscuit and that's the reason i'm asking you to give her some hot biscuit before i go to see her again next tuesday they wanted clothes and they asked for them they wanted pitiful but specific sums of money they wanted protection from their real enemies lord jesus don't let that mean nigger joe fisher stick me with no knife negroes made irrational claims on god which they expected him to fulfil without any help from them and without any regard for the conditions under which they could be fulfilled and i suppose that when their claims failed there was some sort of psychological mechanism that produced satisfactory excuses it was all very simple and direct but god just did not work that way not the white folks god i was taught to worship i do not believe this incongruity set me thinking until at the small and rather exclusive though public high school i attended a science teacher pointed it up he was a bitter frustrated man full of self-hatred and of contempt for his race often staggering drunk outside the classroom he was said to spend his weekends in an alcoholic fog of hatred writing scurrilous anti-negro letters to the people's opinion column of the local paper such letters did appear there with persistent regularity our science teacher was certainly no good for us monday mornings were invariably void of science instruction how many of you went hat in hand to god yesterday and asked him to get your chemistry for you this week he would begin he won't and you can take my word for that the trouble with niggers what malevolent contempt he put into that word is they look to god to do for them that's why they're like they are not only ignorant but stupid not only inferior but debased you can take all this world but give me jesus the song says and that's just what the white people have been doing taking the world and giving you jesus god if there is a god which i doubt helps those who help themselves now study your chemistry how he managed to stay on with his drunkenness and his fundamental corruption of which everyone was aware is not beyond my comprehension so much as it is beyond my belief he was one of the big upper-class mulatto families with members thriving in the professions up and down the eastern seaboard they were not a powerful family having neither money nor political influence nor potent white patrons but they had social prestige because of their antiquity their relatively long tradition of freedom their education and their considerable infusion of white blood in those days the feeling was that such family must not be disgraced by the derelictions of one of its members the black sheep must be protected if he could not be hidden and pitied because he could not be punished such assertions were almost daily fair it was not hard to find support for them i could see that most negroes were poor and ignorant and inferior every year on the last sunday in august one of the negro religious denominations held a quarterly meeting in my home town people from a half dozen states poured in the day before and roamed the streets all night or slept anywhere they could on the courthouse lawn in the wagons and trucks that brought them in alleys and doorways but on the sunday what excitement what noisy exuberance six city blocks just below the main street were inundated with the germinal tide of their living preachers exhorted food vendors shouted choirs sang bands played lost children bawled city prostitutes pushed brazenly for trade among the young men from the country people prayed and went into transports i do not know when i began to notice the white people i suppose they always had been there but along in my fourteenth or fifteenth year i suddenly seemed to see them small phalanxes of them always seemed to be pushing or imperiously demanding passage through the crowds that fell away before them like grain before a scythe the white people sneered or so it seemed to me and took pictures and made derisive comments they looked down in laughing contempt from the windows balconies and roofs of the buildings that lined the street they came also from miles around to watch the show not to be a part of it i realized with deep shame that what the negroes did on this holy day made a clown circus for the whites the negroes god made fools of them worship and religiosity were things to be mocked and scorned for they stamped the negro as inferior 
there must have been many vague progressions of thought many gradations of emotion between the premise and the conclusion however little i was aware of them my nerves muscles and brain conditioned by a thousand random and forgotten experiences must have prepared me to accept the conclusion without outrage and shock i simply rejected religion i rejected god not my instincts but my deepest feelings revolted compulsively not because i was i a sort of neutral human stuff reacting directly to experience but because i was negro it is hard to make it clear but there were two people sharing my physical existence and tearing me apart one i suppose was the actual self which i wanted to protect and yet which i seemed to hate with a consuming hatred and the other was the ideal self which tried compulsively to shape the actual self away from all that negroes seemed to be at what emotional and psychic cost this deep emotional conflict went on within me i do not know it was years before i understood what i had wanted then was to be white it was also years before i made a sort of armed truce with religion and with god i stepped around god determinedly gingerly gloating that i was free of him and that he could not touch me indeed i had to step around him for he was always there he was there four square and solid at the very centre of my father's life my father habitually ends his letters may the spirit of the almighty god whose interest is always manifest be with you at brown university he was in dr washbourne's sermons and president Fonce's chapel talks and professor ducasse's philosophy course he was in various people i met and felt affection for he was in the ineffable tremulous sweetness of the first love i felt in the drowning ecstasy of the first sexual experience in the joy of imaginative creation but i moved around him warily laughing mocking his pretensions determined that he would not betray me into negroness if there lingered still in the deep recesses of my real self some consciousness of a religious spirit then the ideal self the negro hating me did all it could do to exercise it how unmitigatingly and long-lasting this conflict was is proved for me in the fact that only in the last ten years have i been able to go to church without a feeling of indulging in some senseless necromantic ritual and without feeling that my wanting to go and i did many times want to go if this seems contradictory i cannot help it was a mark of inferiority the foolish expression of a weak and senseless wish to attain an impossible realm of being differing in its essential nature that is in its reality from anything my experience has taught me can be attained i do not believe in an afterlife in otherworldliness the experiences of this world are too potent and too much with me i do not see how any negro can believe in another world and the religion which has inspired him to that belief if it has saved him has done so by making him content with the very degradation of his humanity that is so abhorrent to the principles of christianity but it is not alone for the reasons outlined above that i have held religion suspect let us concede that the god of the negroes has been largely a pagan god and largely stripped of the divinest attributes interceding intimately and directly for man without man's help they have fashioned a god to their need but the whites also have fashioned a god to their need and have believed in him and have professed to follow him he is a moral god a god of truth and justice and love i do not wish to carry this too far for i have no capacity for philosophic speculation but it seems to me that if the qualities attributed to god represent man's acknowledged needs and if the principles of christianity represent the universal source of man's social genius then he has sacrificed the fulfillment of his basic needs for the good life to the fulfillment of desires that run counter to the purpose of living he has not given his religion a chance to help him effect that far-going social transformation and evolution which should be religion's end religion has become a disembodied sort of activity when to be effective it should be a social function intimately linked up with man's fate on earth while there is almost no religion operating in race relations there is plenty of god i do not say this facetiously nor with ironic intent 
and anyway it has at least been implied before there is an extensive literature on the part god has played in race relations since the fifteenth century principally god and the word of god have been used to perpetuate the wicked idea of human inferiority i need not go into this farther than to point out modern man's subtle modifications of the idea of god and those intellectual gymnastics that have made those modifications possible even when it seems to me the environment has not made them necessary in even though in the fundamental concept of the godhead is the idea of immutability but god has changed and though man himself has wrought these changes he has declared them god's own changes and therefore factors equations and of a peace with the mysterious and unknowable nature of god indeed god's very supernaturalness his mysteriousness and inscrutability god moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform ergo we cannot know god's purpose in making the black race inferior to the white and we cannot fathom the repulsion which god has given one race for another or one people for another are largely modern attributions which confound the ancient knowledge and excuse modern sin god was not always so and before the ancient concepts crashed under the onslaught of sophistication of scientific materialism and the new philosophies it brought into being christianity had become a way of life it had become a way of life to be striven for because it seemed to satisfy the needs of ordinary men there is nothing mysterious about christianity granted that mystery reposes in the life of christ as let it be said it did not originally repose in god but christ's life and what he is reported to have done are one thing what he is reported to have taught is another what he taught is as clear and concrete and literal as the lead story in a good newspaper he taught that the kingdom of heaven is here on earth he preached that men should love one another he said that all men are brothers he sought to bind men together in one mighty neighborhood he was for all the mystery surrounding him a social engineer with a far and cosmic vision the present age has not denied that he was right though there are those and i among them who reject the traditionally perpetuated events of his life as a factual record his ministry remains the source of christian religion what has happened is that the age while acknowledging christianity as the highest way of life that man has thus far conceived has denied the authority of god to make man live up to christ's teachings the dream of god and the reality of christ have become separated if all this seems oversimplified then i must again plead my lack of resources for such speculation i do not wish to give an appearance of simplicity to problems that have taxed the best religious philosophers of the past six hundred years theology quite aside it seems to me that the bearing which the christian religion should have on human relations throughout the world and on race relations in the western world is simple enough and direct enough perhaps it sounds somewhat a feat to say now as william james said at the turn of the century that life becomes tiresome and meaningless unless it is constantly refreshed by communion with a wider self through which saving experiences come but this seems to me to be true the christian religion offers that communion with a wider self it offers a mature approach to experience modern man's incredible good luck in escaping the direst consequences of conduct unlighted by luminous beliefs and uncontrolled by moral principles is fast running out a third world war may destroy man altogether if that is he does not destroy himself in more subtle and tortuous ways without war it would be foolish optimism not to assume the possibility of this it is not the nobility of christ's life that i would urge it is the practicality of his injunctions it is more a matter of being sensible than of being good what i would see joined is the battle between reason and superstition progress and prejudice order and chaos survival and destruction end of section sixteen section seventeen of on being negro in america by j saunders redding all librivox recordings are in the public domain section seventeen 
now that i come to the end of this essay i realize that i have not done for myself all that i had hoped to do i am not purged i am not cured of my sickness perhaps it is not of the sort that can be cured by individual home remedies i thought that in the writing of this essay i could pour myself out in the manner of a job or a jeremiah or through a kind of free recall achieve the liberation and inner peace which seemed so desirable but even as i wrote i discovered that the very fact of being negro limited the freedom to pour myself out i discovered depths of self-consciousness and facets of experience that i simply could not expose and that gave me feelings of shame to recognize as my own not to write out these things was cowardly of course but no man can tell the whole truth about himself and the charge of cowardice is easier to take than the traditional detrusive charges of negro insensitivity emotionalism abandonment and self-pity moreover what i had to say about myself if it made me appear bad and unprincipled would it be taken as typical of the whole negro race and i found myself being very conscious of this as i wrote i doubt that race consciousness operates in this way in the work of white writers i like to think that i made a clear choice between telling the whole truth and thus saving myself which was my avowed original intent and not telling the whole truth and thus protecting the negro race against the prejudiced opinions which the whole truth would generate but i know this is pure rationalization what i have done in this regard was not the result of voluntary decision it was rather a neurotic web of coercions by the need to feel responsible by the need to have even disingenuously and even though limited a sense of belonging and integration i have never wanted to be free of this need i have never wanted to be isolated or alienated for my belief is that a commitment to something outside oneself is necessary to human and humanistic development i expressed it long ago in another way i did not want sanctuary i wrote a soft nest protected from the hard strengthening winds that blow hot and cold through the world's teeming turbulent valley i wanted to face the wind i wanted the strength to face it to come from some inexpressibly deep well of feeling of oneness with the wind of belonging to something some soul force outside myself bigger than myself but yet a part of me not family merely or institution or race but a people in all their topless strivings a nation and its million destinies what i wanted and still want for the writing of this essay has not done it was to loose and shake off the confining coils of race in the racial experience so that the integration my personal integration and commitment can be made to something bigger than race and more enduring and truer for race is a myth it is artificial and it is i hope at last a dying concept meantime while it lives it is also a barrier and a terrible terrible burden it is a barrier to nearly everyone white and black in america it is a burden to everyone too but it is a personal burden to the negro the burden of shame and outrage imposed on him at the earliest moment of consciousness and never left it till death and all his energies mental emotional spiritual must be held in reserve for carrying it though i could not tell it i saw the whole truth plain and i think perhaps this seeing helped at least to rid me of the illusion temporary at best that there is something ennobling in being able to step aside from the struggle race imposes and that i would find inner security in doing so it was a pretty and an attractive illusion if only i were not negro that of course was the impossible dream wish on which the illusion was founded but i know now that there is no neutrality in being white in america and i have at least the comfort of knowing that some white people too suffer from the limitations and frustrations of whiteness this was brought home to me more forcefully than ever since i began this essay this was the meaning really of a newspaper story date lined brundage alabama june twenty first nineteen fifty one an angry armed band of white farmers shot a negro field worker today on the false rumor that he had kidnapped a white woman forrest jones was wounded by a shotgun blast as he returned home 
after taking a white child hurt in an automobile accident to a doctor's office a burden on the conscience and on the soul this is what the books by both southern apologists and liberals mean this is what lillian smith and hodding carter and howard odom mean i can even believe that john rankin and richard russell and james byrne and strom thurmond signify this in their acts and in their words and that theodore bilbo signified this too whiteness does not mitigate the relentless warping by the race situation in america white men are half men too sick men and perhaps some of them the more to be pitied because they do not know that they are sick some of them the good lucky ones like lillian smith have seceded somewhat in objectifying it but neither for them nor for me is there a neutral ground on which to stand neither they nor i can resign from the human race the best i can hope to do is to externalize the struggle and set it in the unconfined context of the universal struggle for human dignity and wholeness and unity i must confess that unless i have implied them all along in this unconsciously i have no specific remedies for our american sickness i cannot say that education in the formal sense will cure us education has failed and has become tiresome in its failures or perhaps it is only that prejudice and superstition have opposed any serious attempt to apply education as a remedy even though our reason thoroughly grounded in the scientific knowledge in which the age takes so much pride backs the ethic of universal brotherhood and declares that man is a social being who can reach his fullest development only through interaction with his fellows prejudice and superstition as the case confirms are stronger prejudice lillian smith points out declares that there are sacred and profane people according to criteria as infantile as skin color and as primitive as blood and that there must be no interaction between them superstition disassociates the fulfillment of man's destiny from man's character thereby proclaiming that the destiny of society is unknowable and entirely out of the hands of man i cannot believe that laws and government are specifics they are and should be involved with the relationship of the individual to the group but they are involved only on a superficial level laws and government when controlled by the wrong men even a minority of the wrong men as they frequently are in a democracy can be perverted laws and government discipline as talleyrand i think it was said by negatives they say what cannot be done but do not necessarily encourage what should be done they are soulless without them of course we would have anarchy but experience does not encourage one to believe that with more laws and government we would have peace moreover they can be set at defiance and the defiers can often attain renown and rank as courageous patriots i would say that christianity promises a cure for our american sickness but it must be made truly a way of life in which the dignity and brotherhood of man is the first principle perhaps it should be divorced from mysticism and otherworldliness from theology i would emphasize the relation of man to man rather than the relation of man to god i would substitute the authority of christ's insight for the authority of all ecclesiastical dogma i would blazon across the earth love ye one another end of section seventeen End of On Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding